from lunch and we have our two next uh, speakers already admitted to the participant section. And um, I want to introduce um, Wendy Hunt, who is the executive director of the um, Greater Merrimack Sohegan Valley Chamber of Commerce and current uh, chair of their of the group of executives and uh, Tracy Hutchins, who is um, executive director of My Upper Valley Business Alliance, which is a result of the merging of uh, Lebanon plus others plus Hanover plus others, um, and ask and who was is the prior president of that group, and I'd like them to talk to us about what they see as permanent damage or on ability of some of the businesses to reopen how, what, what they're going through in order to reopen and what the prospects look like for coming back to a full business status in the next three, four months or more uh, next year. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Wendy Hutt and, and Tracy Hutchins to talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Tracy, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for having us today. Um, so here in the Upper Valley, we've been very fortunate. Um, I know one of the questions when Susan asked me to appear today was how many businesses have we had that will close permanently that we know of so far. And I, I think we've actually been fortunate that we have not had many. Um, we've had two businesses in Hanover close permanently due to the COVID-19 situation. And we've had a few businesses in Lebanon also close, although uh, none of them were related to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, two of our major retailers, uh, Pier One and JC Penney's, um, are closing, and and those are due to, you know, forces in the in the major retail world. And then we've had a small diner that uh, closed due to personal reasons that was just prior to the COVID situation. However, I am concerned that we've had, we will have businesses that will close uh, soon um, in, in the next few months. And my concern is due to the fact that right now, our businesses, many have applied for the PPP funds or the um, idle loans through the SBA, and they have received those monies. Um, but, you know, it nowhere near replaces the funds that they have lost in revenue over the last couple of months during the situation. Um, so I'm, I am concerned that um, from talking to our businesses that, you know, although they've received those funds, some of them are really hanging on by their fingernails. And, and even as we're starting to reopen, um, you know, it's still not easy. Um, you know, restaurants are able to reopen now uh, for outdoor dining. Um, however, um, I think that is more of a benefit to our restaurants that tend to be smaller in scale, uh, where, you know, they can have the outdoor space and have almost as many tables as they had uh, functioning indoors as normal. But we have some of larger restaurants, for instance, uh, in Hanover, Molly's and Jesse's, which is owned by the Blue Sky Restaurant Group, which chose not to reopen um, because they're, they're very large establishments. The costs for them to reopen are huge. Um, I was told around $100,000 just to buy enough food to be able to uh, support their typical menu. And there's just not uh, no way for them to have enough outdoor seating to be able to accommodate for that like they would in their their regular operations. Um, 
some of our, our smaller businesses are still struggling. Um, there's a lot of, even though they're all following the guidelines put out by uh, the New Hampshire Department of Public Health and, and the GOFER committee, um, there's a lot of inconsistency with those guidelines. And, and so they're, they're struggling with that a bit. Wendy, would you want to chime in? Sure. Um, thank you for having me. As um, Susan said, I'm the president of the Greater Merrimack Sohegan Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I also am the current board chair of the New Hampshire Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives. And so it's with both those hats um, I'm going to be talking to you today. Um, I, I, my chamber covers the 12 towns of the Merrimack and Sohegan Valley region, also in Neck to Nashua and Mer um, Merrimack and beyond. Um, you know, we have a lot of businesses that have yet to open. Um, I worry as a chamber person about, um, you know, a, a few things. One, what are the habits of shoppers going to be now that businesses are reopening? I, I don't think from 90 days ago, we can expect this to jump right into business as usual. Um, also, as, at the end of July, when the extra $600 that is, are part of people's unemployment checks, come to an end unless Congress extends it, um, people are going to be short on cash. So I do worry about um, having enough customers. Um, I, I worry about any regulation or any further burden on our businesses as well. Um, specifically, I would say the business profits tax or the business enterprise tax. Um, as you all know, any business who makes over 50,000 gross is going to be expected to report. And I know last year that um, the legislature had an agreement with the governor that the business profits taxes and the BET would not be raised beyond 2019 rates. Um, so I do ask you to keep that in mind as you consider, um, you know, the state revenues, which I know are going to be down as a result of this. But I do worry about any further burden on our businesses. Um, I, I think we're not going to know for many months to come how our businesses are going to come out on this. Do you have any idea about uh, what's going on with your uh, your restaurant situation or any of your manufacturing, any of the bigger well, manufacturers in your area? Or? Because Hitchner and Aileen and some of the in Airmar have been able to pivot, um, they're doing all right on this in our region. Um, Restaurants, it's been slow. I mean, they've, they've really tried to um, accommodate outdoor seating. Obviously, it's weather dependent, um, their capacity. I, if, I'll give you an example. I went to Hampshire Hills Outdoors the other night when it opened. It's one of my members. And the tables are definitely spaced apart. And I counted maybe in the whole evening, maybe 50 diners, which, you know, normally they would typically do about 200. Um, the owners were actually working it and have not brought back their, their staff. Um, as for restaurants in the northern part, I don't know how they fared this past weekend. I, I would like to, that information myself. I know that um, from a meeting with Taylor Casel this morning that our, our tolls were down 40% from a typical Memorial Day weekend, which indicates to me that obviously there were not people spending money in, in the state. Um, you know, we have warmer weather down here in Amherst um, as compared to up in Littleton or Conway. So, I, I would hope that the governor at some point is going to open the, you know, the indoor parts of restaurants. I'll give you an example. I was just down in Florida, my home state, visiting my parents, and the restaurants opened a week ago for the outdoors, but they can also now have 50% capacity indoors, um, which was like every other table. And I think that was actually a good, um, a good model because you didn't have people on top of each other. Um, they were also having you, you know, use hand sanitizer and wear a mask to your table. Um, I think unless we can step it up with our restaurants and give them some more capacity, I, I don't know, it's already a tough business for most of them. Right, and, and I would chime in that our, our lodging industry has been hit very, very hard uh, by this situation. Uh, you know, in, in our region, we have several hotels. Uh, right now, they're allowed to take in uh, people looking for rooms for essential personnel. One of our hotels in Lebanon has, has been doing okay with that. Um, however, they've let almost all of their staff go. Um, there's only around five of them 
that are, you know, which is the upper management that are doing everything from uh, cleaning the rooms to taking in the reservations uh, to doing the maintenance. Um, we have several other hotels in the area that are, are not open or are very, very minimal. And I think, you know, that going forward, I know I have people who call our office from out of state and are looking for rooms, but I don't, I don't see them coming back as quickly. You know, I, I don't think that people are going to flood to the state and people will be looking to take vacations or hotel rooms uh, like they were before. And I think our hotels are going to really suffer. Um, and, you know, hotel capacity is a very funny thing anyways. If, if a hotel runs at 65% capacity, they're considered successful. And, you know, our hotels in the Upper Valley typically run much higher. So I think across the state, we're going to see hotels having a very difficult time moving forward. Another concern that I'm seeing in our area and hearing from landlords um, is going to have to do with not only um, residential tenants, but commercial tenants. Um, once the governor, you know, enacted the, the uh, executive order of, you know, to stop, stop foreclosures and kind of the eviction processes, et cetera, um, that, that has really um, put a lot of our business owners that, you know, have apartment buildings or even, even, even somebody with a two or three family, if they're not receiving the income from that, um, I'm hoping some of the gopher dollars are going to come to that because also the businesses, even though they're supposed to be paying, you know, 25% of their PPP to rent, it's not covering a lot of the expenses. So there's also concern what might happen to the real estate market if there isn't some sort of relief for the, um, Land, not the landowners, the uh, landlords. And that will also trickle down to the municipalities. I know here in Lebanon, or rather West Lebanon, um, the tenants of our powerhouse mall have used force majeure to not pay their rents uh, to the mall. And that is something like a $22,000 per month uh, towards the city of Lebanon for tax purposes. Um, right. So the city of Lebanon has been meeting with business owners to discuss implementing some sort of payment plan for uh, taxes because they're expecting that there's going to be several businesses that will not be able to pay their property taxes. Also interesting, I'm not sure who else lives in the southern part, um, but as the malls have opened down here, um, a lot of the stores continue to be closed. At the outlet mall um, over on Route 3 in Merrimack, it's, you know, I would say a third of the shops are open. And that's it. Can we answer any <laughs> questions for you? Uh, yes, we have three questions already. Representative Abrami. Yes, <clears throat> thank you both. Uh, I was going to follow up on that comment about retail. Uh, I, I'm more co concerned, like you do, about retail coming back. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, my observation is even once they opened it up, that uh, the, the amount of traffic is not there. Um, that's for regular stores, single stores, or... And then malls, a whole other category, like you started to mention, uh, I don't see a throng of people going back to the malls. I think the malls were on the endangered species list anyway. Uh, I know in the Portsmouth, there were about, before COVID, there was about five stores in our major mall that were just vacant. And then obviously we see this closed. We have anchor stores that are, are closing. And uh, so, I mean, what's your, general outlook for retail in general. It, well, the other comment is that people are discovering Amazon through this when, when the stores weren't open at all. And, uh, you know, how many people are going to continue buying via online versus going to the brick and mortar? Well, you bring up a great point. Um, I, I have definitely seen a lot more Amazon Prime trucks in the area in the last three months. 
Um, and that goes back to um, people's personal shopping habits. And I think as chambers, we've done a pretty good job of getting the message out to our communities. And, and let me just step back for a minute. There are about 50 chambers in the state of New Hampshire, and we have been in constant communication with one another under the um, association umbrella. Um, and this has been a, a really a, a huge um, topic of ours. Um, we've done a really good job with really trying to present to our communities. I hope we've done a good job um, presenting to our communities. Without strong business community, we don't have strong communities. These these are the people that your high schooler goes to to get a donation, um, your track team, your Boy Scouts, your church, you name it. So I think we really um, have to press upon, and maybe that's something you all can help with, with some type of advertising dollars of unless you shop locally, you know, Amazon's not going to be the one, you know, supporting our communities. It's convenient, but they're not going to support them. But but I agree with you that it scares me in the three months that people have been home um, that they'll, they're willing to go to Home Depot and Walmart, and yet I haven't seen them in the boutiques yet. Right, and and we're hearing the same thing from our small retailers. Is you know, if if you're a small boutique and you sell clothing. Um, it, you know, you have, if you're going to buy something, you want to try it on. Well, who wants to go into a fitting room right now? Um, you know, there, there's concerns over, you, you know, just some people are not willing to go out yet or spend time shopping. And, and, you know, and the state really hasn't been saying, even though businesses are open, we still have a stay at home order in place. So there really isn't an encouragement to do that. Um, you know, people are not sure whether to, you know, do they wear face masks? Do they not wear face masks? Um, obviously, we all should be wearing face masks. Not everyone agrees. And, and so therefore, you know, I've heard from some of our businesses that their employees are concerned about working. Um, are they going to be exposed? Um, so there, there's a lot of concerns, and I and I don't think consumer confidence is there yet to go out and support the businesses. You know, some of our, our restaurants have done okay with takeout, um, and people have stepped up to support restaurants in that way. But that's that's a fairly easy ask. You know, you drive you drive over, you pick up your food, you take it home. Going out to spend time in a in a small retail store to do the kind of shopping that some of these retailers need to survive, it's not happening yet. Well, and keep in mind, we don't know what the fallout is gonna be months from now with people's incomes. I mean, are you more apt to stay at home and cook after you've been to Walmart than to go out into a restaurant or a retail shop or whatever, because you don't know what your income is gonna look like. And already a lot of people have taken a huge hit. So that worries me in the recovery that people aren't gonna have the money to spend. Right. And, and some of our businesses such, you know, Walmart is still doing fine. You know, it, it sells the necessities that you need. It sells groceries, um, but furniture stores are not doing well. You know, people are not planning for those larger purposes. The auto dealers are really on life support at this point. Um, and for some of them, you know, they have purchased they have contracts with their franchises and they have to purchase so many autos um, or they're fined, you know? So, so the cars keep coming and they're being delivered, but they're not being sold. And, and if you drive around and you look at some of these auto dealers, you see full lots. And, and, and if you were to go in, you'll find one or two people because for the most part, they've let their staff go. The other industry that's hurting, I wouldn't call it an industry, a sector, would be the consultants, um, the people that would come into your home and fix your computer. Or, um, I mean, we have so many members that are, are sole proprietors that do this type of business, um, you know, recreating websites. Um, Tracy, help me with consultants. I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. <laughs> I put that list. But, you know, any, anybody that would come into your home, unless it's an emergency like a plumber, you know, you're probably not going to have them come in your home. So those businesses are, are definitely you know, hurting. Right, right. And any of your, your small trades, 
Um, some, of, some of our builders are doing okay. I have a, a gentleman who has a roofing business and, and he's actually not seen a lot of downturn. But like Wendy mentioned, anyone that would go into the home normally, your plumbers, your electricians, unless you have something that's dire, people are putting that off. Um, either, either they don't have the income to pay these professionals or, um, you know, or if it's something that they can put off and, and they're doing so. So those people are, are seeing a loss of income as well. Whoops. Susan, we can't hear you, I'm sorry. It's because you unmuted, you muted me when my phone went off again. <laughs> I wish I could mute the phone. Yeah. Um, when um, I've, I've had a couple of urgent problems that had to be resolved with a home visit, it took quite a while to convince people to come and do the home visit because they are afraid as well of contracting the virus. It, that fear may be stronger in the Upper Valley because we had, had the first um, breakout in New Hampshire of, of the illness. And since that time, people have been a lot uh, more willing to, to um, sequester themselves. But uh, we've got three hands up now. Um, I'm Representative Volme. Yes. This is Chris. I think right. Representative Tucker may have been raised your hand with a question. I, you just want to check with her as well. Oh, okay. Um, oh, Edie, you can't, you can't raise your hand. Uh, no, I did it that way. Problem. Sorry, but, we'll take uh, you first. Here in the North Country, lots of people are not happy to see people from other parts of the state or even, or from Massachusetts particularly. They're very, we've only had five cases in COAS and people want people to quarantine for two weeks if they come to their summer home before they go out shopping and doing things. And uh, they're not happy to see them in stores. They are afraid that we'll get infected if we attract the tourists that we ordinarily do. I've had quite a conversation by email with our local chamber of commerce about maybe the state should put up signs saying, wear a mask, uh, always outside, in stores. But these actually aren't rules, they're guidelines. And the quarantining for two weeks seems difficult to achieve. You want a tourist economy that people would come up and rent a cottage or stay at the family camp stay home for two weeks before they went anywhere. Um, so is this true in other parts of the state that we have represented? Do you find that the local population is dubious about trying to resume the same activities as in the past? Well, I'll start because I'm right on the border. Um, I, I will tell you that despite all efforts to keep people from Massachusetts, et cetera, as the governor says, out, um, I decided to venture out this weekend myself onto 101A down towards Nashville. And I thought, oh, I'll go to Home Goods or something like that. The parking lots were full of Massachusetts cars. The lines were around the building in, e in every single place I tried to go to. Um, I would just say personally, I think it's just unrealistic to try to keep people out. We do have the you know, US Constitution and the Commerce Clause. And what I just tell, recommend to people is wear your masks, wash your hands, stay safely away from people because I, at the, at the risk of using the words, the new normal, which I cannot stand, <laughs> it is kind of the new normal. And I, I just think it's unrealistic to, I understand their point. Um, especially if your, you know, immune system is compromised. Um, I would be very nervous. Um, but, but, you know, I, Edith, I think definitely, um, people have that feeling across the state, but I think it's maybe a, a pretty loud minority too, because I think most people are realistic that at some point we got to open up. We, we see that as well in the upper valley. And, and I have had uh, people say to me, you know, there's, there's numerous people from out of state that own second homes in this area. 
um, around Mascoma Lake up in Orford. And, and uh, I have heard that same sentiment as well. Um, I, I do think, however, you know, we, I think the second largest industry in New Hampshire is tourism. And, and I'm hoping though that we will be able to open back up and allow those people at some point um, because th those are important dollars for our state. And they do keep a lot of our, our businesses uh, going. In uh, the summer, Hanover sees something like 5,000 visitors that come to Dartmouth College throughout the summer. And, you know, and even though um, most of the students are gone in the summertime, that traffic keeps our downtown businesses going. So I, I do hope at some point we can allow those people, those visitors to come back. So Joe, do you think we ought to be offering the visitors free masks and not just the businesses? Well, well I, I'm not sure if the, well, the state is just, the governor announced last Friday that we're not offering free masks for the businesses any longer. They have to purchase at the liquor store. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, at this point, if, if someone hasn't gone out and purchased themselves a cloth mask, then there's somebody who is not going to wear a mask regardless. So um, I don't know about offering out of visitors mass, but I, I do hope at some point we can have them come back. Yes. Um, we have Representative Southwest. Uh, thank you. Um, I live in the Upper Valley in the summer and know Hanover well right now. It's kind of a ghost town. Um, but I'm concerned that so many businesses count on the large crowds in the summer, long lines, sold out restaurants and all that. It's very hard for me to picture this summer getting enough business for some of those restaurants to survive. My other thing that hasn't been mentioned by anyone, right now Dartmouth Coach isn't running. My bus company, CNJ Trailways, there are no buses. So obviously this has got to be part of the picture too. Yes, and, and there's some areas of the state that do rely heavily on, on bus traffic for uh, visitors throughout the state. Um, our area sees numerous buses come through as well. And um, I think that is going to be a concern. Um, the other thing to remember, particularly with the restaurants is right now uh, it's all weather dependent. Yes, they can put tents up, but those tents are not allowed to have sides on them. So if, if we get a, a hard summer rainstorm, um, anyone who is sitting there is very likely going to get wet as they try to eat their food. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all very, very weather dependent. And, uh, and that's certainly going to affect our restaurants. And you're right, Hanover, which is usually a very difficult place to find a parking space, is uh, very easy right now to find parking spaces. It is, it is very much a ghost town. Um, I could also comment on, um, um, you were talking about summer crowds. Um, I asked this exact question this morning of Taylor Caswell. We have a weekly call with him as Chamber of Commerce leaders. And my question was exactly that because so many businesses, including ours, all the chambers have you know events planned that keep our budgets afloat and most of them have been canceled. So my question to him was, you know, in these outdoor events, you know, would we be able to have more than 10 people? And he said to look to the guidelines of like the racetracks, you know, where you could have, you know, a group of 10 people, you know, like just like if they were your friends and then space it out six feet, six feet, have another group of 10, you know, that people that knew each other. So sometimes this would be groups of four, groups of six, groups of 10, and that we'd, we would be able to have more than 10 people. Um, so in the lines that I'm seeing, I know exactly what you're talking about, like lining up for ice cream or, um, you know, fried clams, they are doing a pretty good job of putting tape down and, and you know, keeping people six feet apart. Um, you know, but you're right. Is that realistic for hundreds of people lining up? Probably not. Yeah. Speaking um, of tourism, one of the things I, I would ask you to consider also is I, I know state revenues are, are going to be down significantly, but um, 
since we are going to need tourism and tourism to come back to support so many of our businesses, not just restaurants and lodging, but you know, those people come and they, they shop in the retail stores and um, they help support, you know, numerous trades people with, uh, you know, summer homes and work on that is to consider not cutting the uh, travel and tourism budget. I know it's it's probably under consideration, but I, I hope that if you do cut it, it won't be too major or too deep of a cut because we're certainly going to need that, but advertising to get people to back to the state when we're able to reopen. I, can I ask a question? Um, if you yes. all are hearing a, partic a particular date that lodging might open, I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, Tracy. I'm hearing June 8th. Is anyone else hearing that lodging might possibly reopen June 8th? Doesn't look like it. We only have one member that is on these commissions and he's new, he's new to the committee and couldn't come this afternoon because he's in the opening commission. Gotcha. Um, but we could try and ask him. Um, We've got another question from Representative Schamberg. Representative Schamberg? He's still muted. I keep pushing on mute here. How about now? Yep, you're okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Wendy, for appearing today. Uh, Wendy, basically, you mentioned something about uh, your comment about tax rates. Do you have any statistics from a reliable source that show if a reduction in the BPT tax rates proposed by the governor would have a positive impact on state revenue for state services? I wasn't talking about a reduction in taxes. I was just talking about, um, you know, just in general, that I would worry if, if taxes were increased from the 2019-2020 levels. I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not saying either way um, reduction. I was just concerned if they were raised. Thank you. I, I actually had not heard that he was proposing to reduce them, but I'm not in the loop like you guys are. <laughs> um, we have trouble reading the, the tea leaves about these things, but we do <laughs> also have the problem. We can't print money and we do provide everybody essential services. <laughs> And if we don't provide them, the property taxes are going up. So, um, Representative Malloy was next. Hi, uh, I want to back up to the uh, advertising budget and marketing for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I, how much is in that line? How much do we? How much do we spend? And where do we spend it? Because if if that is of a concern to the chambers and businesses in the state, uh, then we probably should be talking, not us, but somebody should be talking about how to prioritize that if indeed we even keep it. So uh, that's just, that's my question. I don't know if anybody here has an answer to it, but uh, I'd, oh. I'd like to see a little more information about that. Thanks. I, I I've, believe I've been advocating for that regularly. Every chance I I got, um, it stems from an agreement with the the restaurants and lodging people that um, we would increase the rooms and meals tax twelve years ago, whatever it was, and but we would give them the ability through what is now the business and uh, economic affairs department to uh, do advertising in whatever markets would be most reasonable to advertise in given the economic situation. So when we're in recession and the rest of the world is in recession, they're going to go after Massachusetts and Connecticut and et cetera, and maybe Quebec. And when we're um, doing, fairly, everybody's doing fairly well and they're 
traffic is cheap, they go after Europe. And sometimes China, maybe. I'm not sure. We haven't heard from them in quite a while. So go ahead. I would, I, I sit on the New Hampshire Travel Council, and I, I believe this last year uh, they were funded at about $8 million, which um, there's a, a certain percentage, and I'm, I'm forgetting what that percentage is of rooms and meals tax, I believe that they are allocated. However, I think this is the first year they've actually received the full allocation and, and typically their budget is rated somewhat to fund other initiatives in the state. Um, so I would urge you to perhaps contact the New Hampshire Travel Council and, and talk with them who can speak much better at it. I'm just a member at large. Um, however, I do think that the state does an excellent job with the resources that they have because New Hampshire's budget for the advertising and marketing tends to be much less than other states. And, and yet we, we do receive quite a bit of uh, return on investment for the dollars that are spent. Um, so certainly someone from the council could speak better to it, but um, I think it's an important part of the state and it concerns chambers. We have several mem chamber uh, executives who sit on the travel council because we, many of us uh, do apply for the JPP grants, which come through the Department of Travel and Tourism. And we use those funds to help with the marketing of the state and in some cases assisting our businesses. And, and those funds go towards you know, printing guides or in some cases doing advertising. Um, certainly, you know, the, the White Mountains um, receive a lot of benefit from that. Um, the Western White Mountain Chamber, the Mount Washington Valley Chamber, they use those funds very effectively to help support that region. So I, I would definitely explore that further. I'd like to add that the money is, how much money is going to be transferred over is in the budget each time. And I think it only went down substantially when uh, Speaker O'Brien was involved. But uh, they do, they have had studies showing that about $8 is created for every $1 that they're done by Plymouth State University um, for every $1 that we spend, which seems pretty good to me. So Representative Abrami had a question. Yes, um, there's one sector we really haven't talked about and that's entertainment. And we have mm -hmm. theaters, we have theaters, so we have a lot of regional theaters that are closed up right now for plays, other venues that do bring musical acts in, NASCAR is huge for us, uh, the one race now that we have a year, um, and then other like the Fisher Cats, for instance. Have you heard from any of your members that that are members of that, that belong to any of these kind of businesses? What are they thinking about? Uh, to me, uh, to me, these are going to be the, uh, the businesses that are going to open last, because there are large groups in small confined areas. But have you heard anything on that in that regard? They 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 are struggling significantly. Um, you know, here in Lebanon, we have the Lebanon Opera House. Um, we have a, a opera company, Opera North. Um, e, e, you know, Northern Stage, although that's across the river in Vermont. But but still, any empty venues like that, um, community theaters almost all of whom are also nonprofit organizations. So they're, they're facing a double, um, a double whammy here, if you will, because not only are they not allowed to open and have their revenue, in some cases, some of the shows that they've booked, they have to book sometimes almost a year in advance. And canceling an event like that, uh, they still have expenses 
that are attributed to that event, even though it's been canceled. Um, there's contracts that have to be uh, taken care of um, and cancellation fees in some case. Um, I, I know our Lebanon Opera House here in Lebanon um, has let go all of their staff. Um, only their executive director is left currently. Um, and, and it doesn't look like they will be able to reopen. And then on the other side of that, they also rely on donations or contributions. And those of course are going to be down as well as, as people are hanging onto the money in their wallet a little closer. Um, I, I think we will see some of those close permanently as well. The ones that have uh, the ability to hold functions outdoors are doing a little better. I know the Tupelo Music Hall uh, recently built a stage outside and did it like a drive-in theater. Um, you know, they had like a space in between. It was really kind of um, ingenious the way they did it. Um, not everybody's going to be able to do that. Not the Palace Theater, not, as Tracy said, the Opera House, um, many of the... Um, Oh, what's the one important? I'm sorry, I'm blanking out. Um, anyhow, it's, yeah, you, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, movie theaters, you know, even if you did other, every other seat, which is not six feet, I, I know they're trying to get guidelines and they've been in front of the reopening task force committee. So um, let's hope they come up with some solutions. Movie theaters are actually struggling a bit before COVID because um, our Nugget Theater in Hanover has said that they are struggling a bit because people Maybe. don't really go out to the movies as much as they used to. They wait for it to come out on Netflix. Um, so, so they have seen a, a downturn anyways. And, and now with this, I, I, think, I think it's going to be very tough for them going forward. And there are also art galleries and um, music uh, I don't know what exactly, we've got a, a music uh, program that's totally nonprofit in Lebanon that, that bought its own uh, very large house last year. All of those are having trouble uh, figuring out how they can provide services in those cases because they were doing them in smaller rooms with small groups. I think the other thing we have to look at, which kind of goes, um, is kind of um, ecotourism, would be the big festivals um, in the state of New Hampshire that draw tens of thousands of people. You know, obviously Biker Week um, up in the Lakes region, all the different pumpkin festivals we do. Tracy and I both ran the uh, Milford Pumpkin Festival at different times, and we would bring 45,000 people in over three days. And the economic impact for the area was huge. So just, you know, economic drivers like that if we're restricted and can't have big crowds, which sounds to me like we're not gonna be able to until there's a vaccine, um, is really gonna hurt the communities that rely on those events. Yes. So uh, we do have, um, Representative Abrami has his hand up again. Well, just to follow up uh, real quick, musical, by the way, in Portsmouth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's really a ripple effect that these theaters are closed, these venues are closed. Even if restaurants open, if these venues are still closed, we know that people go out and they, they'll go to a restaurant before or after the show, that kind of thing. So that's all. Great. Thank you. Good point. Yes. And there are a lot of people who were getting income from these, these projects, which are not going to be spending income. Okay, that's um, a depressing way to end this section. I know. <laughs> Anybody bring cookies? <laughs> I, I do want I, I can I can give us a positive note. We actually held a ribbon cutting last week for a new business that just opened and happens to be a restaurant in Enfield. Um, was obviously was working on opening prior to the COVID-19 situ situation, um, but did open uh, for takeout for about a week. And then um, the order came down that they could do some outdoor seating. And uh, they're, they're looking into that, but they have only been open about two weeks. And uh, 
obviously they're having difficulties. Um, for one, they're having difficulties with their supply chain. Um, you know, just obtaining, you know, the sanitation uh, masks and sanitizer and things that are needed now. Um, and also meat has been somewhat scarce um, to obtain in bulk as well, um, but still they're open and, and the community is supporting them. So um, at, at least, you know, there's a little bit of a positive note before we leave you. Yes, we'll hope that, that it's only gonna take a couple of years to get all of this back that we've had before. So, Wendy and, and Tracy, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having us. Talking to us. Thank you very much. And we're going to have to go talk with the insurance department. Oh. <laughs> okay. I can think of a lot more depressing things about this than I can. <laughs> Happy ones, but, but um, the, we have um, in the audience Christopher Nicopolis, uh, the commissioner, and Christy Rice and Norma Stallings, who we know pretty well. And I think you want to present something to us before we ask questions, we got a handout from you. Well, I'm presuming that that's me. This is Norma. It, Norma, thank you're you going to be talking. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us. Never sure. Here. Okay. Well, I believe that you all did receive the uh, memo that I uh, sent to uh, Chris, and it's basically the same set up it I usually have that page one we're talking about the current fiscal year and what our authorized budget was and what we are where we're at now in what we think will complete fiscal year 2020 and the chart at the top of the page shows that uh, we're expecting approximately 8.8 .8 million dollars in excess of the uh, authorized budget. And basically in the next paragraph, I'll break that down. It comprises of the premium tax being a favorable variance of 5.8 million, plus the transfer to the Granite Advantage Health Trust was a million point five less than what was anticipated and we have a million five in, in addition to the fee revenue that uh, is generated by the, the various licenses and uh, in departments in the insurance department and then so we can I further break break it down into each of the components so that you can see what it was that generated this additional 8.8 .8 million. On page two, that is further detail of how the, the original budget was calculated and what we have for actual numbers. And again, it there wasn't too much of a difference in the tax base from what we projected to what the actual was. The line items that made up the biggest difference is the, uh, the retaliatory tax rate, which is the additional taxes that we collect for those insurance companies that are domiciled in other states other than New Hampshire. And I can tell you that uh, primarily the states that uh, that makes up are Delaware, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont. They are taxed at 2%. So even though their 
pro they're writing predominantly property and casualty, which New Hampshire charges one and a quarter, we still collected at the 2%. So that's the, we had an additional half a million in the, that item. The next one is the retaliatory item tax base. That's where if a, again, a company who's domiciled in Delaware, they charge all their companies a fraud fee of $900. So New Hampshire, in turn, any of the Delaware companies that are licensed and doing business in New Hampshire will collect the $900 from those Delaware companies. And there are several states that have these various uh, fees in predominantly we collect from uh, the Illinois companies because they, Illinois, while well, they have a low premium tax rate, they have an income tax rate that they uh, charge all insurance companies. And the other state that we collect from is Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a number of assessments in uh, additional fees that are collected from any of the companies doing business in Massachusetts. So that's, we ended up with approximately a million dollars more than what was anticipated when we calculated the original budget. Excuse also, me, yeah. is it this, this is on um, business people or businesses that are getting insurance here from a Massachusetts or a Delaware or an Illinois company? No, these are all insurance companies, all mm -hmm. insurance companies that are licensed in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. They are, they're domiciled in sta other states, but they're licensed in New Hampshire. So any company that is, for instance, licensed in Massachusetts, doing business in New Hampshire, they will pay to New Hampshire those fees in tax rates that Massachusetts is charging to the New Hampshire domiciled companies. Mm -hmm. So it's simply the insurance companies, but the differences come from where the company is domiciled but it is a New Hampshire based company, which is getting insurance from an out of state place that has higher rates for some reason. It's a New Hampshire resident that is buying yes. a policy right. from a company that is domiciled in another state other yes. than New Hampshire. Yes. Thank you. So, okay. And Rep. then. Volme, mm -hmm. uh, Representative Major has a question. Ah, sorry, I didn't see I, it. Representative Major. Um, relative to the COVID situation, have you made any changes to the revenues, especially the revenues yeah. associated with the uh, property yes. casualty? Yes, we have. That is on page three, that uh, we have our revised estimate for fiscal year 2021. 20, fiscal year 2020 is not impacted by the pandemic because that revenue is primarily calculated on calendar year 2019 premium written. The taxes okay. are collected in March 2020, but the premiums were collected back in 2019. So, the, so uh, go ahead. Okay, so if we, we want to go on to uh, fiscal year 2021, we originally had an estimate of 130 million. Point nine, and we are adjusting it downward to 128.2 million. The 
areas that uh, we felt were going to show the decrease is the property and casualty uh, line of business and also the uh, marketplace health uh, premium. We anticipate that that because of uh, the unemployment and other factors of the health insurance that that would go down as well. Where, where does that show? Oh, no. Okay, and on page three, there's a little narrative about some of the factors that were considered in the, uh, from our actuaries when they looked at what the impact of the COVID-19 would oh, have I on I was on I was on page four by mistake. Okay. <laughs> well, page four is the detail of, <laughs> and and again that that uh, shows the individual uh, line items that in more detail of what we have, but uh, conversely, what we have here is that while we decreased what are anticipated growth rates were going to be. We have had a pretty consistent upturn to the unlicensed companies. Those are the surplus lines or excess lines of business. And basically I increased what we anticipated for that tax line based on what the three year average had been. And the same thing for uh, license fees and penalties. The average for the last three years has been closer to the 18 million. So while we have a decrease in what we anticipate for the license companies premium taxes, we have somewhat of an offset of, of approximately 2 million that are in the other two line items. So I don't, I don't see the reduction in property and casualty in the detail. Okay, uh, on page four, the first line item is the uh, property and casualty. The original budget was uh, two. Two billion two five hundred and forty three million, and we've decreased that down to two billion five hundred and twenty eight million. Yeah. So that's where you're going to get the the finer adjustments that were made in the calculations, and then a little bit further down, you can see the decrease in the medical line item of net of the uh, uh, federal employee program in Medicare Part D and Medicare Advantage. So that originally was projected to have a premium growth of 2.5 million and we adjusted that downward to a decrease of 3.5 million. Don't we also have the effect of the tail that, that we would owe if we gave up getting uh, the tax instead of having the entire year's tax paid up front? And then when we have a lower tax the next year, we have to, we lose double. And when we have a higher tax the next year, we gain double. Right, you're talking about the deferred revenue. Yes. Now in the, in the past, I believe that you all have uh, used the cash basis because that is mm -hmm. what is we typically do. how government operates is based on a cash basis. It's only at the end of the fiscal year that uh, there's an accounting entry to account for that uh, prepayment 
that we collect in March that actually applies for the time period of uh, July 1st to December 31st. Now, you're correct. When we adjust downward, when we have less premium, what will end up actually happening is that there'll be an adjustment to increase the premium take, taking out the amount of money out of that deferred revenue account. But I don't think that it, my estimate would be that that may be half a million dollars. There, there would be an additional half a million dollars from the deferred revenue for fiscal year 2021. So it's not, it's not huge this time. I think one time we ended up with an $8 million swing. So Representative yeah. Brahmi has his hand up. Yeah, real quick. Um, a lot of the auto insurance companies have been given rebates. Is that inconsequential in terms of this discussion? Or did you give some consideration to that? And if it is consequential or it was an impact? That's uh, last year. Yes, we did have the property and casualty actuary look at that. And he did say that these paybacks were going to have a small impact on fiscal year 2020. It's a combination of how they're paying it back, whether they treat it as a dividend and pay it back this year, or whether they're giving them immediate credit for the next payment that they do have due, or they're actually cutting them a check. There's a number of variances. I can tell you personally, I have three cars and I got $23 back from the insurance company. So I'm not thinking it is, it's going to be a big amount of money that they are going to be refunding and crediting. Yeah. And just to follow up with what Norma said there, this is Chris Nicolopoulos, the commissioner. I think uh, the worst case scenario estimate was about $380,000. Um, so inconsequential. Right, thank you. Thank you. I that, that, that asked the question. Want to know if it was consequential or not. Thank you. Yeah. So, do you, oh, Norma, have you looked at what happened to these lines during the Great Recession? There does um, be a, a history of a hardening of the market. But again, mm -hmm. the insurance industry in itself, it lags behind traditionally all of the other industries. Mm -hmm. And the, from what I've read, it, it would be first the commercial lines of business, uh, the uh, errors and emission policies, they would start uh, getting more expensive. And the other part is that when an insurance company, uh, they, there are reinsurance companies. The reinsurance companies are the traditional insurance companies insurer. So if they have a block of business that they no longer wish to retain the risk for, they will sign a reinsurance agreement with another company. And what I have read, it has in, indicated that the reinsurance companies, they are going to also, it's going to become more expensive for the insurance companies to acquire that reinsurance. So mm -hmm. that, but again, that's not in the near future in, in New Hampshire, it, uh, has not had a enormous amount of uh, impact, but again, we're, we're, we're really uncharted territory right now. So if in fact, the perception is that the industries, businesses feel the need to have more coverage 
it will cost more money. So what you're saying is that that if we get, do get an impact from this and the market gets harder, it's not really going to show up for a few years. Correct. Because right now, fiscal year 2021 is based on what's happening right now. It's based on calendar year 2020. Mm -hmm. So it won't be until the policies that are currently in place start to renew and that I would expect would be in calendar year 2021. So it definitely, well, I shouldn't say anything, nothing is definite right now, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I am confident that it will take more than the near future few months to have a significant impact. So it, it looks like if it happens, it would affect the next budget. That, and hopefully that, by then your, your national level consultants that, that work on these things also have a better idea of what's going on. Correct. And, and we, the actuaries, they would see whatever the re, rate requests are and they would have a better idea of what is going to happen as well. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Right. Have a good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all. And next we go to lottery. Is Charlie in the audience or someone representing him? Uh, yeah, bringing him in right now. Here he is. Uh, Madam Chair, good afternoon. Charlie McIntyre for the lottery. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Hello. This is the shortest uh, document you've ever given us, I think. <laughs> With the most ifs in it, I presume. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, if I could, I could go through where our data suggests we are. It'll take about two minutes mm -hmm. and then can answer questions. Um, I can only submit to you that I worry about making estimates based on never before seen data. Certainly in my experience in, in lottery uh, going back 17 years. So I'll briefly go into it. So um, draw game sales are down tremendously. Uh, that's led by Powerball and Mega Millions, which are off collectively for the year uh, 40%, which is $26 million in sales. Um, that's a combination of a lack of jackpots, as well as a severe drop in the bond factor, uh, which is what we use to multiply the cash available to advertise a jackpot. That being said, both Mega Millions and Powerball have rolling jackpots, which if they continue will increase revenues. Kino year over year is up 12%, meaning the, to this point this year versus to the prior point last year. But currently, when you compare the weeks, meaning right now versus a year ago, it's off 85%. Obviously, that's down because of bars and taverns not being open. Uh, and if they are open, they're open for takeout only. So folks are playing while they're waiting for their food, essentially. Um, sports betting is off 70%. Uh, this is harder to quantify. We've only been up launched for five months, but uh, we have seen a somewhat of a growth with some sports coming back online. Uh, we did a tremendous amount of business in the golf match between Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson on Saturday uh, with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. Uh, we also, with the launch of the Bundesliga, which is the European Soccer League, uh, has seen a launch, uh, a growth as well. So what had been off about 85% is off 70%. Charitable gambling is off 100%. Uh, that yields a loss of about a million dollars a month for charities, as well as a quarter million dollars for the state monthly. Uh, internet lottery is up significantly. Um, 
as you can imagine, folks now can play from their home, so they will. Uh, and what is the most puzzling to us is uh, scratch ticket sales, which had been off 15% during the trough of the COVID, are now running at a rate consistent with Christmas. Uh, we have done two weeks back to back of $6 million in sales, which is um, more than we did the Christmas season. Uh, so in the past week, our sales are up 23%, uh, which is tremendously, trem I can't put enough adjectives on this, tremendously anomalous. Um, and that doesn't compare with our neighbors. Um, Massachusetts in the same period is down 2%. Maine is up seven and Vermont is up 11. So we're up double versus what would be our nearest comparator. Uh, and nor is it statewide. Uh, in some regions we're off significantly and some regions we're up significantly. Uh, and so um, I hate to sort of call it a trend. It's only two weeks and it's not statewide. Uh, and so um, if that trend were to continue, certainly we, that coupled with new sports coming online we would raise estimates. Uh, currently, I believe we provided guidance of 95 million for this year and 100 million for next year. It is likely in the next week and a half, two weeks, we would raise this year's fiscal estimate um, significantly. Um, and certainly with my very brief notes to you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, those are our, the variables we have in play right now in terms of the revenues for this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Um, and happy to answer any questions you may have about anything. Thank you. I was trying to find your actual estimates, which are in the sheet that Matt Chris Shea gave us that I hadn't been looking at so far. Um, could, would you mind repeating what you thought you might, you currently have 95 million for this year? Yes. I'm so our, yes. So that's supported by um, 5 million from last year that was transferred into this year for a couple of reasons. One is, mm -hmm. as you know, we transfer at the end of June for June sales before they happen. So we usually are conservative with that transfer. Mm -hmm. And then also there was an adjustment by the LBA auditors for a retirement, which yielded a, a positive $3 million uh, amount. So of the 95, 5 million of that is from last year to this year. So on a cash basis, it's 95. Um, and I believe our estimate for the year for the budget was 100 million, 100 million point four, I believe. Yes. So but I would, I'm sorry, but I would sorry. anticipate within the next, said so like the next 10 days, if the trends continue, because I do hate calling a trend after just a couple of weeks. Uh, I would anticipate us raising guidance in the next week or two weeks. And you, you'd raise it, how much do you think you might raise it if they continue? Somewhere between three and five million. So it would be between, somewhere between 98 and 100 million dollars would be our estimate for the year. If, if, it, if the trends continue and Mega Millions rolls again, which it has been for now uh, 18 weeks. Uh -huh. Okay. So then all of next year's you think will be be at a, a hundred million, which is yep. what we were expecting for this year before all this happened. So you think it's still going to take a while to get back what you were looking at before. Yes, I mean, certainly I was, we're, like I said, we made the estimates and did the work before we saw what was a significant growth in scratch ticket sales. Um, <laughs> and like no time in our, my history, certainly with the lottery and the folks I work with, is it harder to estimate retail behavior by, by players of a discretionary product? Uh, only because the, we saw the bottom and the top happen within a month of each other uh, in my history of, of lottery sales, which is not common. And so it's hard to sort of plan out for the next year when it's been inconsistent with the last six weeks. Right. 
But hopefully so, by next year, they'll have figured out sports betting again. I hope. I hope. I, honestly, um, a large portion of our sports betting estimates for a full year relate to a physical location being open and socially mm -hmm. distancing within a physical location will be obviously tricky. Um, but in a weird sense, that actually benefits by having real sports or major sports up and running with no fans because folks want to have the fan like environment and they can't do it at the facility as at the stadium. They would, prefer, they will do it at the a physical sports book location. If that makes sense. Are we opening the physical sports locations? Not yet. No, they're not open, but they're slated to open as soon as they can. One uh, in Seabrook was ready to open five days before we, uh, in March, before we closed everything down. We're closed at the bars and taverns down and they closed down in, uh, in lockstep with those. How much of the, of the scratch tickets comes from, from convenience stores versus bars and taverns? Scratch ticket sales, oh, it's 98%, 97%. Uh, the greatest loss in scratch ticket sales has been the stores that no longer carry it. We've had a number of stores close. Um, temporarily some closed permanently uh the market basket chain has stopped selling lottery tickets um during this period so we've seen a loss in sales in there um what bars and taverns is is negligible in terms of what they sell for scratch tickets and scratch tickets uh, to that point uh, madam chair scratch yes. tickets is our number one revenue source for the state it represents more than half of our net revenues yeah Right. So some of the stores have closed completely and a number of them have just discontinued it for now. Correct. Correct. They don't like um, the transfer, the close transfer of the transaction happening repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And some like uh, Hannaford's only sell through the, the, the machine, the terminal that says you walk yes. out and they don't mm -hmm. sell the customer service anymore. Mm -hmm. At least now. Right. And Market Basket has just not not selling at all. They're not selling at all. Correct. And, and as you can imagine, Market Basket is one of our larger chains. Yes. Of stores. Okay, we've got three questions now while I was writing. Representative Major. Well, thank you. I was looking, the official plan for 2020 was 100.4. So we have this estimate of 95, we're, we'll be down 5.4 for 2020. And the official plan for 2021 is 110.4. Mm -hmm. And from Charlie's estimate, we'll be down ten million dollars. That, that's correct, Representative Major, and those are what I would categorize as conservative estimates. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the scratch ticket issue, and there's sports betting opening up further. Yes, the $10 million increase for 2021 is actually basically scratch, uh, sports betting launching uh, as, a, as a product line and making $10 million profit next year. We just launched real early, six months early. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is Representative Abrami. Yeah, I'm just curious, Charlie, hi, um, about charitable gaming. I know it's a small, very small percentage of our revenue, uh, but my understanding is that there are conversations going on about opening them uh, slowly. What are you hearing? Certainly, um, I know that members of the charitable gaming uh, operators and charities appeared before the reopening commission uh, and made their case about how they could do it. Um, as a as a, pro, as a center for profit for the state, it's not really a profitable enterprise. We make about two and a half 
$3 million. It covers essentially the cost of regulating them. Um, but I do know the charitable community has been very vocal about how much money they're losing because they all, all these dates were scheduled, as you can imagine, all these March dates, April dates, and May dates. And now the charities that have had dates are gone. And so um, they're losing, like I said, a little over a million dollars a month in just direct revenue to charities. So um, I know they're clamoring to reopen again. Uh, can I just ask a follow up then? Uh, in terms of sports book places, Seabrook being the, uh, the example you used, is it would it be true that that it would all happen all at once if then if their charitable gaming is not open and sports sports book isn't open or are they separate issues? I mean, they're separate facilities. They're actually in the case of Seabrook, they're in different sections of Seabrook. And obviously, I know you know that facility pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it hasn't been determined. Certainly, it's in pencil, not pen, as to when they open. They were ready to go in March. Like the, the equipment's in place, the wiring's in place, the televisions have been mounted, the um, trading platform was built already. So it's quite literally a switch um, for, for us, for them. Are some of the other locations also charitable gaming locations? Yes. The second location is going to be the, is in Manchester, and they also are a charitable gambling hall. Um, one of the benefits to charitable gambling facilities doing this is that um, they have most of the operations in place, they have mo most of the internal controls in place, they have surveillance in place, um, and they have what we uh, found out to be through our research, very much more likely folks interested in sports betting. Because if you like to play, you know, cards, you like to bet on sports to a much, much higher degree. So. Uh, the Manchester facility, I think, is ready. Will be ready in August. Okay, same question, though. Will they be delayed? They're not as big as uh, Seabrook; has a lot of elbow room. Um, will it be tied to charitable gaming opening at the same time? I would think so. I mean, I certainly would think so. Yes. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. And also, the, the, the partners that are chosen are chosen by DraftKings, based on a number of factors that that we then approve. It's not our choice. It's DraftKings is, looks for um, maximum utilization of what would be a, a player base as well as that comports with their uh, brand standards, as it were. Huh. So how many more places get to get chosen? Um, well, they'll be they're, they're occurring one at a time. Obviously, that process was slowed uh, dramatically by um, this whole um, affair. Um, and obviously it has to be in a, in a town or city that approved it. Uh, so um, numbers three and four are very much in pencil. Uh, one obviously we'd like to put up in North Country and then one, a second or a, th a fourth one on the border as well. Um, it was our hope that we, we would have um, a fourth location identified, but we don't yet, uh, or third and fourth. Um, we're going to be building them one at a time. Uh, we're in this for the long haul, as you can imagine, so we don't want to make a mistake on a build. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, on uh, Representative Doucet is next. Hi, uh, just going back to the scratch tickets, Charlie. I'm wondering how big of a component of the revenue is the online component. Uh, you know, not the physical tickets, but not online. Revenue. You're, you're fading in and out. I, Representative Almy, I think I heard his question, if I can answer it. Oh, good. Yes, uh, he asked, I believe, what percentage of the scratch tickets is the f physical ones versus what percentage are the virtual ones through the internet? Yeah. Uh, so our profitability this year is about, well, estimated about 55 million on scratch tickets, 54, 56, depending on what happens in the next five, six weeks. Uh, and our scratch ticket profitability on the internet will be around six. So it's a factor of one to 10. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And the next question is Representative Malloy's. And you're, you, you need to be there. Hi. Uh, a little bit more about charitable gaming. Uh, I'm on a 
a board that um, has missed its date this year. And uh, we had a considerable conversation about that yesterday in a, at a board meeting and a development committee meeting in that group. Um, I think from just listening in on that conversation, it was uh, the organization itself. And I, th in our case, is very confusing about how to move forward with this on the charitable gaming front. Um, uh, it's, I, I didn't, I couldn't offer any real advice on how to proceed. Um, I think that revenue for us is gone for the year. I don't know how to get back in that uh, list. Um, and I, I'm, so I have a question about uh, the future of charitable gaming and how effective it's going to be if it's going to, if we can't get things up and running and, and I, to my group, just say, forget about it. That's, that's an observation. That's of course. not a question or a comment or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, I mean, it's just, it's been, it's been frustrating. That's all. I guess that was a comment. Thank you. Representative Burstein is last, I think. And he needs to be opened up too. Thank you. Uh, hi, Charlie. Thanks for coming today. Of course, Representative. Uh, your first bullet point regarding the variables, it says that no more than 2% of the businesses that carry our product fail. When you say businesses, is that a synonym for outlets? Do you count Hannaford's as one or as however many uh, establishments they have? And why did you focus on 2% when we read about I'm reading 20, 30, 40% of restaurants are not going to reopen. Now I know that that's not a hunt, that's a subset of the universe that you're citing, but 2%, I just want you to double click on that number for me. Of course, yeah. Um, as you can imagine, we anticipate across the spectrum, some will, will fail at a higher rate, obviously. Um, when you look at the number of bars and taverns we have now, it's only about 190. So while a larger portion of bars may fail because of the lack of business, um, the vast majority of our current businesses we do business with are considered essential and still up and running. So community stores, supermarkets, gas stations, like we do 51% of our sales of traditional lottery through C stores with gas. So they're still up and running and still in business. And so while they've been affected, it hasn't been to the same level. So. That's why I don't anticipate a much higher failure rate. And I knock on wood heartily with that statement um, amongst our retail network to your question representative, then you would like restaurants. We don't count on for a, for the majority of our revenues. We only count on them for Kino, which this year was going to net us around six or six to $8 million, uh, which will be less than that. will be probably five to six. Um, so we, the, the failure rate amongst them at a higher rate, while tragic, is not as impactful in our revenues. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So Keno is still going on. Yes. It's, so we're doing about $150,000 a week in Keno. Uh, and before the crisis started, we had had our two <laughs> best weeks ever when we were doing about $800,000, $840,000 a week. So... Um, it's quite literally folks going to a place that serves food, ordering food, waiting for their food and play. Uh, they're allowed to congregate to play, but not to eat. It sounds like I was wondering about that. I, I, yeah, I guess. I, uh, I think they're socially distancing within a, a closed restaurant or six feet apart, buying tickets and uh, you can play a bunch of numbers at once. You don't have to buy them one at a time. You can play. 10 mm -hmm. at once and wait for 10 draws if you so wish. Yeah. And the tickets are good for a year. So you could play 10 tickets, leave immediately, and they're, they're good for a year. Hmm. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Looks like we've, we've done that. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, Representative. This helps a lot. Thank you, members committee. Thank you. And that takes us to liquor. And 
we have coming in the Commissioner Malika and Tina Demers, the Chief Financial Officer. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Joe Malika and Tina Demers from the Liquor Commission. Mm -hmm. And Tina will run you through the numbers and let you know where we're at. Good afternoon. The document that you have in front of you shows our original plan for liquor of 132.8 million. We're mm -hmm. projecting um, a revised plan of 130.1 million, which is a 2.7 million off that plan. That is primarily, mainly due to the Hampton properties and not selling the property to be able to pay off our debt. Mm -hmm. So as far as our, our revenue from liquor sales, we're on target for making those projections. And looking at the 2021, the plan is 133.8 million. We're revising that to 131.1, um, which could go up if we sell the Hampton properties within next fiscal year. So some of those revenues were put in because of the change of selling those properties and paying off those bonds, and those properties have not been sold yet. The RFP for the realtors has gone out, uh, and we should be making a selection for a realtor soon to uh, have that sale go through. But it would go through after June. That's correct, Madam Chair. Yes. I'm a little and then confused. Looking at... okay, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna go through the beer tax. So the mm -hmm. beer tax plan is 13.1 million. Uh, we're, we're revising our estimate to about 12.8 million, which is uh, about $300,000 off the plan. And for fiscal year 2021, the plan was 13.1 million. We've revised the estimate to 12.9, which is about 200,000 off the plan. What I wanted to ask about was there's been a 2.7 million change in both year, each in each year, amounting to 5.2 total for the biennium. And are they're both related to the same property or? Correct, correct. Because what was put in there was selling off the properties at the beginning of this fiscal year and being able to pay down our debt, which would have decreased our bond payments by that 2.7 million in each of the fiscal years. Uh, okay. That's, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. So other than that, our plan remains unchanged as to what you see in front mm -hmm. of you. Yeah. We hear that liquor is being deluged with customers now. Well, our sales at our, at our outlets are up. 5.2% or nearly $34 million. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously our partners in the restaurant world uh, have uh, been distressed greatly by the uh, COVID pandemic and uh, we're not seeing or recognizing any sales from them mm -hmm. that are significant at this point. As they begin to reopen, we are seeing some sales come back uh, it's, it's not a large amount of money, but we're, we're wishing them the best, of course. They're our partners, and uh, they're devastated by this. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the, what we're looking at is the outlet sales and not the, not the whole sales. No. Well, what what, you, what you're looking at is our, yes, our total revenue. He was just um, stating right. where we're at currently yes. and up in sales. Yeah. Right. All the growth, right. all the growth has been in retail, Madam Chair. Right. Okay. Um, we've got two questions. Representative Abrami. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, last time we chatted was a couple months ago, I guess. Um, 
a couple of stores, a bunch of the stores were closed because you couldn't, because of, couldn't find staff. That pretty much been resolved. Plus, you were doing some kind of a bonus or something, a bonus payment. Can you just give us an update on uh, that? No. Sure. The, the governor, in a, an executive order, allowed the Liquor Commission to uh, offer a 10% increase, hourly increase, for our employees in the outlets, our sales employees. That is still uh, going on to this point. At one point, we had as many as 568 employees out of the workplace, out of about 1,200. Uh, we had 15 outlets closed. At this point, we still have uh, 14 outlets closed. We're reopening three outlets uh, prior to the 7th of June. And we, ha we still have about 186 people out of the workplace, both full and part-time. And we just did a consolidation of our Franklin and Belmont stores into the new Tilton location. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, Representative Graham, <clears throat> you had a question? I was, I was along the same line. I was just wondering uh, what the net impact was of having uh, the approximately 15 stores that were closed and, um, and you know, what your, what your thoughts were, you know, short of any new, uh, new pandemic uh, burst here uh, when you would plan to be, be back and fully operational. So, so your retail. Well, closing. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you, Representative. Closing the outlets uh, and decreasing the hours. All the outlets are now open from 11 to 6. Uh, the, the impact on sales has not been negative. To the contrary, the impact on sales has been positive. As, as I've said, we're up 5.20% or nearly. $33.86 million. So having those stores closed and reducing the hours in the stores had ha have had a net positive effect being that the restaurants are closed. A, a lot of the restaurants are still closed. So our goal in the future is to look for the efficiencies in the reduced hours and in the reduced stores. And those are some studies that we're doing now. Uh, as I've said, we've reopened, as of, as of yesterday, we had one store in Milford that was reopened about a week ago. We plan on reopening the stores around the lake prior to the 7th, and then we'll take the rest of the stores in priority of revenue, uh, revenue production as we reopen them. Representative Stringham, you had a follow-up? So the follow-up, uh Based on what I'm hearing, you saying part of your long-term plan may be to close five or ten of these stores permanently? Uh, so no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I, I, what I'm saying is that with the stores being closed and our business partners in the on the restaurant side, what we call our on-premise partners, and reduced hours, the revenue still rose by nearly thirty-four million dollars. So what we're looking to do is make sure that when we reopen these stores and when we look at expanding the hours, we continue to do it as effectively and efficiently as possible. So you may see some of these stores in, in the future not open as early or stay open as late. We're doing a heat graph on where our business is and the hours that we're seeing. And obviously we're seeing some cross-border traffic back into the state. Our, our stores on the highways, the tolls were down by as much as 50% at some point, and our stores on the highway, which are obviously our top ten, in our top 10 stores, we're seeing revenue loss of as much as 50%. And the in-town stores and some of the smaller locations are the stores that are actually doing the increased business. So we're looking at all the trends that are taking place during the pandemic and transferring that information across as we reopen these stores so we can do it as effectively and efficiently as possible. Okay. So we do not have, I do not have a number of stores that are going to close. 
but I do have is some consolidations and some opening of new stores. And what I, what I do per perceive to happen in the future is some reduced hours in some of the outlets. But obviously the governor has tasked us with efficiencies and we're looking to any efficiencies that we can possibly make to keep our revenues where they need to be. And at this point, other than that change for the, the uh, property that has not been sold in Hampton yet, we are on target to make our revenue plan. Right, we appreciate it. Representative Major, you had a question? Yes, in, in the sale of the property, you feel pretty confident in FY21 of be sold? We do. We've had we've we had a number of uh, realtors come to look at the property, and we had some very uh, some very positive feedback from a lot of the people that are out there. Obviously, we've had a lot of interest over the years since there's been a plan to sell this property, and I feel that we will have a sale in 2021. And for the amount of money you had anticipated. I, I feel that that's still a fair number. Yes, Representative Major. Thank you. You're welcome. And Representative Ames. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so actually two questions. The first one is the, uh, I don't know what it was called, the essential workers uh, payment, uh, the extra money for- uh, Bonus for your bonus okay for uh, your workers and uh, i believe that comes to an end at some point and what's your plan um beyond that I, I think i remember that's out of federal money or not out of our state budget directly um so that's one that's one question maybe i should start there well, that was a 10% raise representative that was put in place by the governor uh, yeah. across the board for any of the frontline workers in our stores. Um, you know, that has an end date along with the, with the proclamation put forth, but there's not an end date in place at this point. And that is money that is state funded. That is not federally funded money. It's in our revenue estimate it's offset by the increase in sales. It's, it's a small dollar amount in the scheme of things. Okay, well, that's helpful. I didn't know that. Yes, uh, the, the entire expenses from, from the Liquor Commission are taken out now before we see the revenue. Right. Correct. Um, okay, and then the other question is quite different. It, um, last time you were before us a year ago or so, um, you were telling us about the uh, competition from a very big uh, store, or maybe there were a couple of them. Uh, one of them positioned, well positioned in uh, Northeast Massachusetts. And um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what the story is today on all of that. That's Total Wine and Spirits, which are. Yeah, uh, right. They are, as, as, as I've reported before, they are the largest uh, brick and mortar beverage alcohol retailer in the United States. About 140 stores in 23 states, six stores in Massachusetts, all east of Northborough. So they're all on the inside of the 495 belt. Uh, they've positioned them obviously in areas that could have presumably affected our business in New Hampshire. Uh, they have been impacted significantly by this as well. And uh, not, only, not only in Massachusetts, but nationwide. Uh, you know, they, they remain a, a constant factor against our marketing and, a, and our, and our uh, management of what we do. You know, they're, they're a constant competitor. They've been affected as, as everyone has. So, you know, I, I think that I would say that nothing has changed from, from the standpoint of who they are or how they run their business. We have effectively managed and market, marketed against any type of, uh, you know, 
downward trend that the Liquor Commission might take, uh, given the, the size of the retailer. Uh, they've begun in the last six months. They typically come in, they build a number of stores, they undercut everybody in the market by 10, 20, 30 percent. They gain, they gain some business, mainly a, a private label retailer, and they gain some business and then they start to raise their prices. And they've, they've done that in Massachusetts, they follow trend. So to this point, their prices are, uh, in, in a lot of cases, actually higher than what we charge, and in some cases, uh, equal to what we charge. So their, their effectiveness in marketing against the Liquor Commission has, uh, you know, been nullified at this point. They're a competitor, and we treat them as such. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the question. Uh, Representative Abrami had his hand up, but it's gone again. Yes, it's gone again. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> now it's a curiosity, big picture question. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the people who produce all your product, if you will, uh, has there any, been any supply chain issues for you? Or is no, we've and why not have been a problem? No, at this point, we haven't seen any supply chain issues either from the distillery standpoint or the winery standpoint. In fact. Uh, there's been a glut of, of, of red wine, especially out of ca California and France. So uh, I think we'll be enjoying some great buys over the next few months. And uh, obviously next month is our American wine sale. So I would, I would ask everybody to take a look at the stores if you're an American wine enthusiast and, uh, and buy in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Looks like we've got it. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you, Madam I have Chair. One question actually for for Perfect. Chris Shea, which is, as I recall, on um, you take a percentage of the overhead to and remember it from from the um, revenues each month to put into to what we get in the monthly revenue focus. And did you add in the 10% extra staffing cost? So, so in, the revenue, in the revenue focus, that's done by administrative services. Ah. So that when and you that get that- And that number comes from the, us. Right. So all the information comes directly from the Liquor Commission to administrative. Oh, okay. So the, the Liquor Commission actually um, estimates each month what it, what it is and sends it over. Correct. Great. Thank you. I thought we threw it up at the end of the year. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. You as well, thank you. Yeah. And we're, we next we've got the Department of Safety. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Steve Lavoy, Director of Administration for the Department of Safety. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you have our our revenue projections. Um, what I thought I'd do is just kind of give it a, an overview of some of the assumptions that we've made and arriving at these figures. Um, obviously the big caveat with all of these amounts is that we've done our best to consider all the available data when developing these projections, but everything is, is subject to change um, and we've never experienced this condition before. So um, we have- Could I just interrupt you for a second? Yes. For everybody who's trying to find the right pieces of paper, we have a, FY 20 to 21 plan versus projected from the Department of Safety. And that one on, I guess we don't have to, to compare it with the one that's in the worksheet that was given to us. I apologize. 
At first, I couldn't figure it out. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we, when we established our projections, we, we made some high level assumptions. We started with looking at the impact on our April revenue collections um, and, and carry that forward uh, for the remainder of FY20 and then into FY21. And we assumed that there'd be a slow and steady recovery throughout the end of calendar year 20 into December, but that we would still have an overall decline moving forward into January, uh, from January into July for the end of FY21. So high level, that's the approach that we took for all of our revenue sources. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go through each one individually and provide you with a little bit more detail on, on those, those specific assumptions. So road toll, typically with road toll, I, I talked to you about three different factors that impact it, that impact fuel consumption, and that's price, weather, and the economy. And oftentimes we're really worried about weather and we're really worried about price. Right now, the economic conditions um, are really putting, though, that's where the big focus is. Um, price is a, is a positive right now. It's, it's extremely low, $1.96 uh, for a gallon of gasoline. Um, it's expected to stay low based on U.S. Energy Information Administration estimates, um, only, seek, only reaching $2 by the end of F, uh, FY20, I'm sorry, calendar year 20, and then $2.17 by calendar year 21. Um, but even though it's low, and even though the weather's good, especially good right now, the economic impact that COVID has had is, is keeping people off of the roads. Um, and so that's really having that, the heaviest weight and downward pressure on uh, our road toll collections. So what that's leading us to um, when we're looking at traffic rates, um, we, we reach out with DOT and see what they're seeing on the roads. Um, they started off at the beginning of uh, the COVID event, uh, over 50% decline in traffic. As we're moving through this month, it's starting to recover somewhat. We're in the 40s range now, um, according to DOT. And that's really aligning with what we're seeing in road toll collections uh, also. So for road toll projections for the rest of FY21, FY20, we're projecting to collect 114.7 million. Um, that's an 11.9% decrease from plan. Uh, this assumption, um, we're, we're making is that we'll have a 50% year-over-year decrease in collections in both May and June. Uh, this is based off of our April collections, which were down 25%. And with road toll, we're collecting in arrears. So our um, April collections on April 20th actually represents March usage. So when we looked at that 25% number, um, we realized that's half of a month of COVID impact. So uh, it made sense to um, increase that to a 50% impact for May and June. The good news is, is our preliminary May amounts are coming in closer to 40%. So it looks like we were overly conservative there. The difference there could, is, is about a million dollars uh, in revenue. So that is positive, but we're gonna keep an eye on that, especially as um, we're seeing more traffic out there on the roads. Carrying that forward into FY21, we're projecting to collect 115.6 million in road toll, which is 12.6% less than plan. Uh, and we assumed a 40% decrease year over year in July collections. And that's slowly increasing to a 5% decrease in December. And then we have e either a three or a 2% decrease for the remainder of January through June. So again, trying to capture the impact of, of a recovery over the, the next six months, but realizing that there will be a longer term impact um, on, on revenue collections for road toll. Could you send those monthly charts to us? The, uh, yeah, the monthly estimates. That you're reading from? Yeah, these are, these are a summary of, of those sheets. I can absolutely send you the details. Great, thank you. Um, the next major source of revenue uh, has to do with DMV. Um, so one of the good, news, the, uh, a little bit of good news is that many of the DMV sources, um, the revenue is not going to necessarily disappear or, or be lost like, like road toll, but will be shifted. Um, DMV has worked hard to stay open as best as they can, and they're offering services online uh, by appointment, by phone. There's drop boxes at eight locations, um, and so that's really helped to minimize the impact uh, on our DMV-generated revenue. Uh, registrations is the first area. We're projecting to collect 84.2 million 
in 20, uh, which is about 1% less than plan. Uh, April was down 12%, and we assumed a 15% decrease in May and a 10% decrease in June. And then carrying that forward into 21, we're projecting to collect 82.6 million, uh, which is 3% less than plan. Um, and that assumes a 10% decrease in July, um, improving to a 5% decrease through December, and then that 3 to 2% decrease for January through June. Um, motor vehicle operators, this is your license revenue. Um, so again, customers here can renew online once every 10 years. Um, and uh, we've also, DMV also um, is allowing through, through executive order has been allowed to um, uh, expired licenses or those who were, will expire by June 30 could apply for a six month extension. And so what that did was allowed us to collect that revenue now um, instead of having it shift into future periods. Uh, and also real ID compliance, that deadline has been extended to October, 2021. Um, and so that's, that was an important piece that, that the customers were concerned about. Projecting out our, our revenues um, for FY20, we're expecting to collect 11.8 million in, um, in operators revenue, which is 11% less than plan. Uh, April revenue collections were down 43%. And our FY20 uh, projection assumes a 45% decrease in May and a 50% decrease in June. And then projecting to collect in FY21, 7.3 million, um, which is a 13.8% uh, decrease from plan. Uh, it's significantly lower than FY20, but that was a planned dip because of the, um, the dip year when we moved from a four-year to a five-year license renewal. And so that's already been accounted for in our plan numbers, which is why the percentage is um, relatively consistent with the prior year projection. Moving on to inspection station fees, um, we're projecting to collect 3.9 million, which is a 7% over plan. Um, we, we had collected uh, additional revenues throughout the year, which is why there's an increase here. However, April was still down 13.8%, and we carried that forward into a 15% decrease in May and a 10% decrease in June to arrive at the 3.9. And then we're also projecting to collect 3.9 in FY21, um, that starts with an assumption of 15% decrease in July through the 5% decrease in December, and then the overall 3 to 2% decrease for the second half of the year. Motor vehicle title, um, the automobile dealers are still open and DMV still providing title services. Um, they, they, um, there has been a drop that we've seen. Uh, based on that, we're projecting to collect 8.6 million in re uh, revenues. Uh, in FY20, which is an 11.6% decline from plan. April was down 53%, and we assumed a 53% decrease in May and a 50% decrease in June. Uh, then we're projecting 9.4% uh, in collections in FY21, which is 4.3% less than plan. Um, and this assumes a decrease of 25% in July, improving to a 5% decrease through December and then the overall 3 to 2% decrease for the rest of the year. And then finally, miscellaneous fees. Um, the, these, this is the area that includes plea by mail, court fines, license restorations, and some other miscellaneous uh, fees. Um, here, we're projecting to collect 16 million um, in FY20, which is a 5.2% decline from plan. April collections were down 54%. And we're assuming a 50% decrease in May and a 61% decrease in June. And then we're projecting to collect 16.6 million in FY21, which is a 4.1% uh, 4 under plan. And as, these assumptions are an average decrease of 50% in July, improving to 5% through December, and a 3 to 2% decline for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, so again, our total highway fund uh, revenues for FY20 are 239.4 million, uh, which is just under 20 million short of plan. And then we're projecting for FY21 uh, to be 234.9 million, which is again just over tw uh, 21, just 21 million uh, short of plan or 8.2%. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have related to those, uh, to those estimates. 
I would really like to get the month by month you've been talking from because it's rather difficult to follow without that. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to provide that. I'll 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 provide that to thank you. Uh, to the committee. Mm -hmm. To the committee. Uh, can you do it tomorrow? Sure thing. Or or today, <laughs> whichever. <laughs> thank you. Steve, you um, can go ahead and send it through me. Okay. And then I'll make sure the committee gets it. Good. Uh, Representative Abrami has a question. So we uh, we talk about in other conversations with others that uh, auto sales are really down. So that would, I guess, not impact you folks because people just hang on to their cars and register their old cars uh, versus registering a new car. Uh, but I, I just had a random thought for everybody uh, that I think this is going to impact our towns because uh, there's there the revenue the towns get from registration is a lot more. Than the state in terms of uh, of uh, based on the value of the car, so that's something that we should all keep in mind with our towns. Um, yeah, there was really no question. It's just it's just a musings here on my part. Yeah, you're absolutely right because we are at the state level. It's uh, the the fee is based on weight, um, so that's not going to change if you hold your vehicle longer. Uh, we won't be impacted, but the, the towns absolutely will be. Uh, because the value is going to continue to decrease. Yes, that that and a lot of property tax uncollectible. So, um, any further questions about this one? Then, thank you. Oh, how do you how do you have the state troopers just? estimating how much traffic they're seeing on the roads? Is that how you've been doing that? Um, as far as uh, the plea by mail amounts and, and those those figures? Well, no, you were talking about um, the traffic. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So DOT um, has traffic counters on the turnpike system, and then mm -hmm. they have some, um, some equipment at, at other areas across the state. And so we, um, we typically reach out to DOT and ask them what they're seeing from their traffic counting, because uh, they're very concerned about that for turnpike system purposes. And we incorporate that data into our analysis. Okay, thank you. So, so this is biased towards the big roads. Um, yes. No, I must say, I haven't been seeing a whole lot of traffic until recently uh, on the other roads. But recently, things have been getting a lot. Uh, they've been maybe half normal at this point. And they keep going Very up every week. Um, I'm certainly seeing more traffic over the last two weeks on the way in. Uh, driving mm -hmm. in, I've been seeing more traffic um, heading into Concord than I have a month ago. So I'm noticing it anecdotally as well. Right. And there, there is an awful lot of construction being done. <laughs> There's always construction being done. <laughs> yeah. A lot more smaller projects. So you think you've finished with one and you go around the corner and there's another. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Representative Woolery has a question. Yes, um, on the traffic. Looking at the post from the uh, state police, it should also be a rather large increase in plea by mail. Uh, although most of the ones that they're publishing on their website, they're going to have to appear in person because they're going to be, go to jail for doing 134 through a construction <laughs> zone. But um, speeding is up, stops by speeding are up. And as a result, that will generate, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it will generate more revenue. Uh, as opposed to 50 $10 fines, there's going to be five $500 fines. Uh, just numbers, not facts. Just just as a point to, to, of consideration on that. Done? That would be interesting. We yep. usually see fines going down during during recessions. 
Yes, because but people are driving faster, much faster. I mean, up, <laughs> up your area, they just had a guy coming down the hill. And he was doing 100 miles an hour going down the hill, heading into Lebanon. I mean, yeah, it's easy to speed there. But 100 Boy, miles an hour? That one didn't even get into our, our city's uh, police bulletin. <laughs> no, it was done by the state police, see? Okay, we only look at the, at the city one. Thank you. Got it. So, any further questions? Then, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And now we get to a slightly more difficult way of doing this. Have people been looking through all the other um, presentations that we were giving because the idea was that we would ask questions if we had anyone and we'd bring someone up from the audience to discuss them. But in order to have asked questions, we have to have all looked, we have to have looked at this. And I'd say we've got For, we've got a number of things in the judicial system which, which does not provide a huge amount of money to us, but which seemed uh, a little uh, noteworthy that the fees from background checks, that made sense that to me that the fees from background checks have gone down considerably because employers are not employing new people and because landlords are not going to be able to find very many tenants to replace the people that they're going to evict. And they can't evict anybody at the moment. And there was a question, entry fees which is also landlord tenant uh, issue, that those are expected to go, go down quite a lot because of the governor's mandate, but in, but bounce back up possibly considerably the next year which makes sense. And I don't know. Representative no, Balmy, Representative Brahmi has got his hand raised. Who? Representative Brahmi. Oh, yes, Representative Brahmi. On the, on the summary sheet, are you on court fines and fees? Yes, I'm on court fines and fees. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, I, I would like an explanation of what, if there's somebody from America, that they, they did a uh, pretty big drop in uh, for next year. I guess that's what you're trying to get at there, but. It's, yes. A big you know, so we have, we have Donna Raymond from the courts and Chris Keating from the courts that can respond to any questions you might have. Yes. So go ahead, Representative Abrami, finish. No, I just, I just looking for the explanation on uh, the, why they estimated what they did for 21. What the, the entire amount, you mean? Yes, just in general. Because they have it broken down. Hi, uh, is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so sorry. actually, I, um, I let the actual data sort of inform my projection and attached to the spreadsheet that was sent. It's actually an Excel document. There are hidden um, tabs in there. One of them is the day by day revenues that we collected in each one of these revenue accounts. So we have sort of the pre-pandemic through March 13 revenues, and then we have the post March 16 and on. And I looked at what was um, happening. We had 
it was interesting, you sort of saw the week of March 16 through March 20 was sort of a transition week where that's when you really saw things slide and then things sort of leveled off after that into the second week after the governor's stay at home order was issued. So, and then, so obviously the impact is great, but I, I tried to let those several weeks um, after March 16 inform what I thought was going to happen um, in terms of fiscal year 21, sort of a low end and a high end, not really knowing how all of these factors were going to influence the numbers. I think, you know, there are a, a couple of things at play. Obviously, stay at home is going to have somewhat of an immediate impact. Um, but as the state opens up, we've already seen in the last month, anecdotally, we've seen more cars on the road. So that's a good sign. I do believe, though, that the unemployment issue is going to inflict a deeper wound that's going to take longer to heal. That's also going to affect some of the revenues that we um, take in, penalty assessment, um, court admin fees from safety and motor vehicle, because they're all motor vehicle related in some way. Um, so I try to, each, for each of the four quarters in fiscal year 21, estimate what I thought was going to happen percentage-wise of an improvement um, and factor that into the overall figures that you see there. But So in short, I tried to look at different um, factors at play, what I thought was going to be happening on a quarterly basis, having it um, informed by what we saw post-pandemic. Representative Abrami, you. Uh, I did. Uh, yeah. So I had a concern who was, uh, who was trying to get early on and was having trouble. Uh, we had a DUI. He wanted to resolve the issue. He was told that the courts just haven't been open. What's what is going on with the courts? Are they how far behind are they? Are they are they pleading out things more quickly without court appearances? What's going on? Is there a pent up bunch of cases out there that could revenue in the future? So, Donna, I'll try to answer that. This is Chris Keating. Chris Keating. Chris Keating. That's you may want to. Too awful. awful, Donna. Do you want to give it a try? Yeah. Donna, do you, want to give it a try? you may. <laughs> Chris, is your phone muted? <laughs> yeah, no, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you go. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, sorry about that. Um, so the, the courts have been trying to limit the number of people who come into the courthouses uh, since this started to just emergency hearings, people seeking um, protections from abuse, uh, guardianships over incapacitated people and the like. Um, but we've been open for business and every single courthouse has been open all day long, every working day. Um, and what we're trying to do is get the word out to lawyers that we are wide open to take anything that they can accomplish over a WebEx uh, session, over a teleconference or by paper. And so it's been a struggle to get the word out to lawyers because the lawyers have been so accustomed to showing up in court with a client, but the the administrative judges have been trying to get the word out to to lawyers and anybody who will listen that we are we are willing to to entertain any creative method to resolve cases. So if people want to submit uh, a a plea to a DWI, um, we'll do it by paper. We're even doing pleas in felony cases by paper. And, uh, and these are self-report people to uh, stand committed sentences at the jails on paper. We're doing just an astounding amount of work now. We've got all of the courts set up on WebEx to do uh, hearings by WebEx and evidentiary hearings where people are submitting documents uh, electronically. So we're just, we, not until June 15th are we letting more people into courthouses to conduct, uh, to, to conduct hearings and their sort of regular business. Um, but even so, we probably won't go back to having as many in-person hearings as we used to. Uh, and we really do 
we really plan to do a lot of stuff by this method, ideally without the crazy echoing. Um, uh, but in the future, just try to try, try to resolve cases as efficiently as possible. And so, you know, the message that I would say is have have your have your constituents or friends, lawyers, just get in touch with the clerk and make arrangements to get things resolved however they can. But to follow up, is is the with that all said, is there is there a backlog of cases that have to still work their way through? Absolutely, sir. Uh, there is. Uh, so let's tie that to revenue. You anticipate then that there's a backlog of revenue that goes along with that if found guilty kind of situations. Yes, sir. Um, we've uh, we've canceled in the circuit court thirty thousand hearings um, that uh, that need to be. Not all of them will be put back on the docket, but at least. 30% of them will need to be put back on the docket, you know, because some were, you know, anticipatory dispositional type hearings um, that, you know, are just never going to happen again. But, but resolving the case will happen, which will result in, in, in fees and fines getting ordered by the court and collected by the court and delivered to Treasury. Okay, thank you. And if I might also add to the extent that may be helpful, we are continuing to make inroads in sort of transforming the courts. Um, we are in the process now of deploying some of our staff as well as Bureau of Court Facilities staff to visit a small, medium and large court across the state. We're going to be figuring out what we need to do to get the social distancing in place, the signage, the stanchions, the, the tape on the floors. And then Bureau of Court Facilities is going to go out to all of our courts and get that set up. And the goal is to have all of that marked off by June 15. So that will allow us to control a little bit more what's going on inside the courtrooms. Um, in terms of equipment, I think we're, we're pretty well stocked in terms of masks um, and sanitary um, sanitization supplies that we need. Um, so kind of taking things um, in steps and then seeing are we on solid footing with what we're doing before we progress to other things. We've also requested nearly 100 laptops um, that we hope will be funded through the CARES Act funding to see if we can, um, again, transition some of, of what we do um, more remotely. There are other issues too that we want to consider. Um, are there ways that people can handle hearings by phone? If we have individual has a phone and a smartphone and the court has a smartphone can we do something with that but again that can get complicated but i think we're trying to do things you know um step by step and see how we go but we're continuing to make inroads with this thank you could i ask a question about that i think i'm reading this chart correctly uh the plan for this year was almost 20 million, including the highway money, and I'll just include for the moment. Um, and you're projecting almost 18 million, but next year, with all these changes, you're planning on 10 and a half million to 12.8 million. Correct. Which is a lot less than what you think we're getting out of this year. So after you've made all those changes and you're starting to catch up, you, you still think, sorry, we're going to end up with a lot less revenue? I think what I'm concerned about is the, the deep impact this is having on the economy overall. Uh, I was not with the judicial branch in 2008. Um, Unfortunately, I joined in June of 2012, but it would be interesting to compare what the impact to revenues was in that scenario, because the only difference there, well, a primary difference is the stay at home order that's in place now, but the economy being hard hit this time as well as last time. But I suspect, even as you had mentioned, when we have a bad economic downturn, you see motor vehicle fines and things, they tend to drop off. No, so I'm anticipating some of that, but again, it's just, it's more, you know, the stay at home orders are gonna lift, things are gonna open up more, so that will help things, but I just think it's gonna take a long time for the economy overall to recover. People are still gonna be out of work. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I, I tend to be conservative in my estimates and, and be pleasantly surprised and disappoint. Well, we could probably look, we can look at those fairly easily overall without, without the detail. 
um, ourselves. But I don't remember anything like this steep a dip ever. And I was here for the Great Recession. I was here for 10 years before that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, I'll be looking at it month by month, and well, obviously, if I see upturns and things, I will revise these estimates. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further, uh, Representative Brahmi? This is uh, for you, Suzanne, maybe Chris. The numbers you were just quoting don't match up with what's on the summary sheet. Uh, Chris, were you paying? Yep. So what um, Representative was, was referring to is the total revenue collected by the courts, highway funds. So if you look at the document, the summary document, you're going to see motor vehicle fines is um, but in the middle of the page. That's their highway funds. And then the other piece that is different is uh, the first row penalty assessment. Right. That revenue goes into the other category. So when you're looking at the court's revenue um, on your estimate sheet, it starts with court admin fees and goes to miscellaneous sales revenue. You back out the penalty assessment. And that's what I did on your worksheet for you. Okay. So that, I guess, prorated across all those things. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and I didn't have looked, looked at that one on here yet. So court funds and fees. Is not well, it's still considerably reduced for 21 about 25% or so from 20. Okay, so it'd be interesting to look at look at we'll go back and look at those for the Great Recession see what that did. Any further questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Now, I don't know if we want to bring up uh, Charlie Arlinghouse and the, I'm not sure if the comptroller is with us today. Uh, Representative Valmi? Yes. You have lost Charlie, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Erlinghouse and um, the comptroller. They had to go to another meeting. Ah, okay. There are specific questions that the committee might have. Um, the comptroller reached out and said they'd be happy to address them if I sent an email to him. Yeah. Does anybody have questions about the other revenue sources? I, here, I'm trying to, I can't show this thing. <laughs> If, if you trouble. have questions specific to what Treasury does as it relates to other revenue. Uh, yeah, Treasury is abandoned property only. Um, and there was interest budgeted. Um, the, and the, yes, the interest which down below. typically isn't, so they could talk to that. Mm -hmm. um, if they're still here. Oh, okay, yeah. She, so, so Monica is still still available to talk. Oh, good. Good afternoon. So, good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, members good of the afternoon. Um, Monica Mazzapelli, Commissioner of the Treasury, and with me also is um, Rachel Miller, Chief Deputy Treasurer. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, we did have. A considerable increase in in the interest and surplus funds category for this year and no projection at all for 2021. Yes so um so as you as you as you hear up there right now um the interest rate environment has completely changed um, so um, in the last few years, we've been able to um, earn some um, hard dollars, hard dollar earnings 
uh, with the interest rates um, that were increasing over time for the last three to four years. Um, due, the, due to COVID-19, the Federal Reserve had to react and, and try to um, um, try to respond to the crisis. So they lower interest rates um, from 0% to 0.25%. Um, so with that, we anticipate that the interest rate environment will continue to be low. And um, there are other factors that, that we were considering. Um, also, we anticipate that with the revenue decline that we, we, we are estimating, our, our unrestricted cash balances will also decline. So with that, we have to look at different different um, different ways that we've been doing uh, maintaining our cash balances. We may need to go back to what was done in 2008, 2009, and years after that, try to maintain um, compensated balances uh, in order to defray the the cost, uh, the banking costs, because those will remain. Um, so knowing that interest rates are going to remain low for some time while this crisis it improves. Um, and um, again, knowing that our uh, banking fees and, and costs will remain probably the same. Um, so that will be one way to, to, to try to mitigate those factors. So after looking at that, you know, again, I mean, this situation is, is, is uncertain, unclear how the revenues are gonna look. Um, you know, maybe fiscal year 20 will be okay, fiscal year 21. I mean, you're looking at revenue estimates right now. Um, depending on how that performs, uh, there is a possibility we may need to engage in short-term borrowing. So that completely <laughs> changes the picture of what we've been doing and what we thought, um, you know, a year a year ago. Um, you know, to, to give you some context, um, the rates, the Fed rates last year were, um, um, let's see right here, were 2.5%. So now we're talking about 0.5%. So again, there's there's no interest right now in in, in, in the anticipation of that being being there for a while. So those are the pieces that made us really rethink how we, um, you know, we're estimating uh, interest. Mm -hmm. And we decided to eliminate it for fiscal year 21. So fiscal year 20 will be um, okay. Um, but again, it doesn't appear that we will have interest for fiscal year 21. Okay. I remember there were a number, maybe four or five years, that the treasurer had no interest results at all after the Great Recession started to take hold. Exactly. I think for several years that was not estimated, that was not considered. Um, I think prior um, prior to 2008, I think there was um, I think there were some estimates being um, presented in the budget, um, but it's been, it was several years that that didn't occur until um, the budget for fiscal year 20, 2021. Anyway, we're back to where we were a few years, a few years back. Okay. Would you like to say something also about the the um, abandoned property? I'm not sure how many of the people on our committee realize on. Um, What's entailed in this and why it varies so much from year to year? Yes, and um, um, I, I didn't I didn't provide any detail because I wasn't sure um, you know what type of questions that you will have. But um, you know, as you as you may recall, the um, is, is, um, the escapement revenue is really the abandoned property that was reported to us, but we were unable to return to the rifle owner. So that property has been with us for three years. The law allows us to, um, you know, what is not returned, the law allows us to, uh, is cheated to the general fund. So in that estimate, um, we, there are several factors in that formula. Um, we know how much um, was reported to us three years ago. Um, we have to, um, we have to, um, you know, determine how many claims we've paid against those those um, those properties. Um, the law also allows us to deduct the administrative costs, so we do that. And then after that, it's just a calculation um, that we do, 
in order to determine what is distributed to the counties and what can go to the general fund. A variable in that calculation that is difficult to predict is the, is the property that gets reported to us in the form of securities. Um, the cash that was reported that's known, we, we, we know exactly how much that is. What is unknown is the security. So before we cheat um, the revenue to the general fund, um, we have to liquidate um, positions. We have to liquidate securities. And, and that is um, the securities that get liquidated, those go to the general fund. The hard part of this is that obviously um, when we start doing this process of liquidating um, the securities, we start this process um, around uh, March and then we continue that process all the way through um, before June. So we're able to, to do that calculation. Um, this year, um, when we started looking at the, what was being liquidated, we, 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 the stock market um, had a decline of 20%. We had those uh, hard days in March. And fortunately, the stock market re, um, um, uh, recovered um, somewhat, but, um, but we had to, so, so that's really the decline for this year. Um, we, what we were thinking in, 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 in every year we, it's because that's a hard number to predict. What we do is we, in order to prepare an estimate, we just take a 10 year average and we just put it in the calculation. So the numbers that we put in for fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 are based on the 10 year average that we maintain. But we don't know how the stock market is going to be performing at the time that we need to liquidate those securities. So this year, um, we had a little bit, I'm going to call it a loss, but it, it, I guess it wasn't um, as positive as it was in, in, in previous years. For example, mm -hmm. 2018, 2019, we had some good proceeds from those sales. Uh, unfortunately, this year we had to, um, you know, that wasn't as positive. And, and that's why those numbers this year are looking like that. So we had um, an estimate of, um, um, let's see my numbers. what you have on your sheet uh, that was provided by the controller. We have, um, we went down to 8.8 million from 14.1 million. The, 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 and, and for fiscal year 21, um, again, we just, we just adjusted that a little bit. So we kept it at 17 million, 17.3 million just because again, we don't know how the stock market is gonna be performing a year from now. And, mm -hmm. and we don't time the market, you know, our policy is not to try to predict the market or, or anything like that. Again, we just, we just follow policy, we sell the securities, the time that we do it every year. And there's some good years and the others not so much. Um, overall, our goal is and our mission is to return the funds to the rightful owner. But again, since the law allows us to, to those funds that we weren't able to return, then we were able to cheat them to the general funds. So that's the story there. Um, I don't know if you will, you have any additional questions related to that. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to say that if I resurface 10 years later after you, you had cheated and say, hey, that was mine, I believe that you pay it out of the general fund through through governor and council. We do, we do. So the law allows uh, to return the funds anytime, even if it's been 10 years, like you said. So we, yeah. we go we go to governor and council and request those funds and we and we typically pay those 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 funds to the rightful owner. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else you'd you'd like to say about this? I think we covered everything that's on this sheet. And thank you very much, Monica. My pleasure. Have a good afternoon. You too. Um, Chris, I don't know if you could help us with this. There, there seem to be three, six, eight funds that were among the bigger funds that they usually analyze that have been moved to restricted funds by the budget? 
Are you talking about the um, other funds? On the engineers boards, the electricians boards, the right. permits. So, so a, a number of um, funds that under the joint board or the um, what used to be the joint board is named o OPLEC, OPLC, used to be generally funded. And two sessions ago, um, it was the legislature decided to make those a restricted fund. So now all that money goes directly to the fund, pays all the bills of the OPLC throughout the year, which is where all the boards are located now. And then at the end of the year, they will lapse any surplus in that account back to the general fund. Huh. So it does lapse at some point, but safety managed to hold on to the plumber's board somehow. There were, there were, there were a couple of boards for different reasons that didn't get um, grouped under the OPLC. I can't actually speak to the reasons because I don't I'm not aware of what they are, but there were some that um, there was decisions made not to group them. Right. Okay. So I think that we're stuck as we usually are in this, in just accepting the numbers that the commissioner of DAS comes up with for, for other revenue sources. Because... To, Every single one of them varies in different directions for special reasons. And Representative so Almy, just so that, uh, to remind the committee, I mean, the, the comptroller does work with the agencies that collect that revenue to, to, you know, if there is an up or a down related to that. So it's not just the comptroller, you know, doing it all on her own with her staff. There is a, uh, some work done with the agencies that are responsible for collecting those revenue sources in that other category. Yes. Okay. So I guess I hadn't asked that question since we got a control. <laughs> but that's. So you that still one. have several um, agency people that are available to answer yeah, any questions you might have. So would you like to uh, Barry point Glennon out? is there. Who? Barry Glennon, who's the. Yes. The Securities Bureau is available. Good, he's, he's the around. next. From HHS, if you want to talk about Medicaid recoveries. Oh, you the didn't department is there if you have any questions about the fish that. and game revenue. Um, and then transportation is available if you had any questions related to there. They have a small piece of the highway fund. Yes. Um, it's only about $200,000, but um, earlier there were questions about traffic flow and, and things like that. The Department of Transportation um, puts a lot of those types of reports together. So uh -huh. I just wanted to let the committee know we have still agency people that are available and questions you might have. Okay. And we don't have anyone from the Department of Justice about the tobacco settlement. Not today, uh, no. He did he did submit a letter, memo that um that yes, I he did. In the packet. It doesn't talk about what seems to be an apparent increase again in cigarettes, but we won't know for a while. So it's, it's pretty proper that, that he's not speculating on it, I guess. Um, so securities revenue, they've had some delay in revenues because of the COVID pandemic, but they expect to get to regular operations in June and meet the plan. And their projections for the next year remain the same. I don't know if anyone wants to ask about um, the likelihood that there will be as many securities people out there when we get through this as there are were in January, which I believe is what their revenues are based most of their revenues are based on is securities people and securities firms. No questions? We can go forward. Um, but you said- Representative Abrami has a question. Representative Abrami? 
Yeah, I mean, Jay, you said there was no change. And I'm, again, I'm looking at the summary sheet. And for this year, it went down, securities went down 2 million, their projection from 45 to 43. And the slight reduction, well, about 1.3 million reduction for next year. So um, I don't know if that's different than what's on the sheet you're looking at than the summary. Yeah, yeah it is. It's complicating having the actual numbers in one place and the, and the report in another place. Um, but uh, yes. So Mr. Glennon is there, he can, he can respond to that? Yes, okay. good. Mr. Lund? Glennon, are you there? Yes, here he is. Uh, yes, we, up. our plan, the, the plan that came from DAS, no, the plan, the plan that was in the, the budget was for 45 million in 20 and 44.3 in 21. And you're speaking to another, a different plan, which is for 43 million in 20 and 43 million in 21. Looks like we're having some issues with him being able to speak. Uh, but what I, if I could dare to speak um, based on the memory, the securities provided estimates to the ways and means a year ago when you were building the budget the numbers were lower than the numbers that were agreed to by the legislature. I believe that's what he is um, basing his estimate. When he says the estimate didn't change, it's the yeah. estimate originally provided the committees. Right. Not what the legislature finally agreed to. Mm -hmm. But until we can figure out how to get him to be able to speak. Yes, I think he might be able to now oh. if you <laughs> Are you- uh, I'll stop talking, Barry. <laughs> can you hear me now, Christopher? Yes, we can, Barry. Okay, no reverberation or anything like that? Nope. Okay, great. So, so I don't know if you heard what I just said, but I was basically yes. suggesting, or you did hear, okay. Yes, in fact, uh, that, that that would account for the difference. Uh, the legislature had put it in at, I believe, around 45. Our testimony before Ways and Means has been consistent in um, projecting uh, 43, 33, um, but we have experienced uh, a slight reduction, uh, as indicated in my memo to Representative Valmi. Um, there is, there has been some impact with respect to COVID-19 pandemic, delaying some of the agent testing, uh, as well as a delay with regard to uh, some of the hard copy mutual fund filers, which is really a significant source. Uh, but uh, I'm still confident though, that if business resumes in June, uh, if New York and Chicago and some of the major cities and law firms open up, copy filers um, uh, performing in June. When I say performing, I mean actually getting back to business and forwarding those fees to us. That's been a, a major issue for a lot of the firms that they, they have the ability to work from home, but to be able to actually request checks and issue checks um, has been an impediment for them. Uh, so that's why I'm hopeful that we will projected. Thank you. Um, this has been a problem with a, for a couple of agencies uh, in a lot of uh, terms that the legislature does increase the numbers at the last minute. Um, and those are the ones that that we're operating off of. And it's quite proper and has, I've heard a number of other times, um, including very early on, um, for you to say those weren't our numbers, but <laughs> but they are the numbers that you also have to, to say, okay, below the official estimate, which is the budget estimate. So. Yeah, um, I, 
clear and I do apologize. Oh, well, that's on behalf of the, the legislature that does this kind of thing, I apologize also. <laughs> <laughs> so any further questions on Representative Rice? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, it's not a question pertaining to this. I just need to let you go. I have to leave this meeting because I have another meeting I have uh, to be on now. Okay. Okay, but thank you. Yeah. We're pretty, we're close to the end anyway. So, okay. Thanks, Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody. You too. So, um, the next. Representative Almy, um, you fish said, and game. Uh, health and human services could talk to recoveries, but we didn't get anything from recoveries except what you put in the chart. Representative Almy, yes, I, I did get an email from the fish and game, and uh -huh. leave by four o'clock. So I don't know if there's any questions you have for them. Oh, yes, I can definitely. respond to the comment you were just going to make. Yeah, I would like to. So you have um, Director Normando and Kathy Labonte. Um, right. I right. think they may be on the same call, but I'm not positive. I gather from looking at the report that they sent that they have um, somewhere in their revenues, I guess, in miscellaneous sales and income, they put the grants that they get and they they've managed to get two grants that show up in the revenues, which uh, are remarkably healthy for fish and game. I don't understand about the two grants. Do you hear me? Yes. What we did was we had a sale of one of our properties. Mm -hmm. That sale, uh, went, went, which went through long range planning and, uh, and G and C, uh, the the revenue from that um, was five hundred and five hundred and thirty six thousand dollars is being used to match a million dollar grant from NOAA, which mm -hmm. we've been grant. Although that's uh, which is not represented in, in on that sheet, but we have won that grant. Um, to uh, do a significant amount of work on a large property we own on Great Bay as part of the Great Bay uh, Research Reserve. And we put it, we put it in a highlight um, because we, had the, we, we put the revenue from that sale in that miscellaneous sales and income line and wanted people to understand what that large nut was as it, as it is unusual. Uh -huh. So the revenue is in the miscellaneous sales, but the NOAA grant and, and park acquisition, I guess, um, doesn't show up. Acquisition? Well, um, I'm trying to remember the National Est Estuarian Research Reserve Procurement Acquisition and Construction. Uh, well, I thought it was for, for using the game farm for something or other. We sold uh, the game farm trust. We sold the game farm in Brentwood. Mm -hmm the funds that we got from that sale for a major renovation project on a piece in Greenland. We have 100 acres there with over 3,000 feet on Great Bay. Uh, okay. So that, but you've got the rev, you've got the revenue in here as surplus revenue, but it's actually been spent on something that is being spent in the expenditure category. Well, it hasn't been spent yet. It's just sitting there pending, oh. uh, pending contracts and all the other things that have to go on to, to expend it. Uh-huh. 
but it is earmarked by us for that project. Okay. Which is, which is the only reason why it went through long range planning and GNC, because otherwise you, know, you normally don't dispose of state properties just to pad the fish and game. So. Right. Okay. Representative Malloy has a question. Representative Malloy. Representative Malloy. Representative Malloy. I'm here. Yes. There Thank you. you. Uh, I just uh, want to weigh in on this. This um, I have no comment about the, the the money here, but I just want to say that this is a huge deal. The purchase of this. And a vast improvement of an area around Great Bay has been neglected and been. Uh, uh, there's some work that's going to need to be done and some re remediation, but a great, great resource. And I want to commend the Fish and Game and everybody for uh, weighing in on this and, and making this happen. This is uh, this is a terrific resource for the Great Bay. <laughs> when this property opens, uh, when we can really. Uh, get done what we want there. I think the public is just going to eat it up. It I'm is. It's seeing a beautiful spot. Beautiful spot. Thank you. Okay. On the other page, why? Why would unrefunded road tolls for? Off highway vehicles and marine go up in oh in next year uh, because we're we have looked at them and in in recent years um, those numbers represent what we've been getting for many years we did the seven hundred and eight hundred based on long term averages but over the last years with more boats and more especially more OHRVs our uh, revenues have consistently been in the range that we're projecting here and so we've met we're maintaining uh, we're just bringing we're bringing the projection in line with what um, recent history is saying is going on okay and you have increases next year in court fines and penalties. Were those also in? in yes, those were also in this year too. Sorry, I was reading this one quite late last night. Representative Volney, oh, Representative Brahmi oh, has his hands up. On Representative Brahmi. Back to the core licenses. Um, I know why we talked a couple of months ago. Turkey licenses were way up and all of that. So it looks like you're projecting this is going to go back pretty much to normal for next year. Number two, while we're on the topic of Greenland, is the, is the, is the Greenland property adjacent to the Stratum property, is going to be adjacent to the Stratum property or further up? Uh, what is, what's the Stratum property? The, Are you uh, Sandy Point? Yeah, Sandy Point. The Discovery Center? No. The uh, the Greenland property is just up the up the shoreline from the Portsmouth Country Club. Oh, okay. But in terms of uh, the uh, licenses, you looks like you're projecting pretty much what you had projected. Maybe a slight uptick. Yeah. Well, you know, given the uh, we have hopes that the licenses will uh, will be up uh, going into. 21. However, um, you know, we're in a very special circumstance right here where we've had really huge increases in our fishing licenses, which is, you know, not to be unexpected when you look at nobody could even go out and play baseball, but they could still go fishing. So all of the normal spring sports stuff is pretty much shut down, but people could still go fishing and they are going fishing. And uh, so we're happy to uh, uh, to take uh, 
uh, those fees. And I certainly hope that if some people maybe have come back into it, they will continue. But I would not bet the house on the fact that it will um, be the same way next spring when potentially all of the normal activities are back in play. Um, fishing licenses have a notoriously high wash factor where often people will buy them, uh, you know, two out of every five years or whatever, or there's, there's less consistency um, with the same person always buying fishing licenses overall. So, um, you know, we, we, we're optimistic, but, you know, we really don't want to extrapolate uh, the conditions we're in right now to the, to too far into the future. Thank you. Right. That sounds... fact, for the world, uh, they probably hope our fishing license sales go down because that may mean we're getting back to normal. <laughs> Spring turkey right. was also very good this yeah. year. Yeah. So which? Spring turkey hunting. Uh, really? In May we had record turkey license sales also. Good. Okay. So, so you'd like this to continue until the deer season? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we have a little problem there uh, in that. Well, that would be great. Um, we're also uh, being stymied in our hunter ed classes because of all of the uh, restrictions and whatnot. So we have a backlog of, of folks wanting uh, hunter ed certification. Mm -hmm. And we really have not got a great way to, uh, to deal with it. So they can, they can take the program online, but they still need to do a field uh, a day of uh, field activity and uh, we're hoping to be able to uh, accommodate um, uh, with a with a full out effort in August but um, we probably are still going to be highly limited in the number of people per class that we can have in, in play so I'm not sure uh, there'll probably be some constituent unhappiness uh, is that plays out, but um, absent uh, some changes in the in the uh, in the uh, um, numbers allowed for gathering and all, we're probably stuck with that problem. Thank you. Well, I think that that looks pretty good for you this year. Yeah, we're we're lucky. <laughs> right. On the, on the bad luck of everybody else. <laughs> but, well, but take it when you can get it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have two other small pieces. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Apparently she's been waiting around to talk to us about Medicaid recoveries. Well, she was available for questions, if you had any. Available for questions. Yeah, right. And so you have Karen okay. Rounds, um, who's available to talk to you. Yeah. Well, does, is everybody okay with the estimate for Medicaid recoveries? You're recovering from the estates of people, mostly. And... Um, at this particular time, there's likely to be less money out there to recover. I don't know if that's a good way of, of synthesizing that one, but, but um, maybe we could go on to the Department of Transportation, which I don't think sent us anything except the, the numbers that you have in here for uh, miscellaneous in the highway fund? So, so I had emailed uh, Marie Mullen and she confirmed there was no changes in mm -hmm. the that um, she provided was just the turnpike report that was also in yeah. the I sent you. Huh? I don't think I saw a turnpike report, but we don't get to do the turnpikes anyway. 
so. Um, I, it was a traffic report. I think there was some, uh, some oh, questions oh, yes. as to the flow of traffic and um, what's been happening with the COVID and stay at home orders. Right. I sent them. What impact that's had on the roadways. To everybody yesterday in case they wanted to see that, that we are every week now coming up more closer to normal traffic. It's still going to take us a while, but but we've dropped from about 59% to um, loss to, to 35%, 38% this last week. Yes, this, on the, the this is on turnpike tolls, which of course is not all the traffic in the state. Right, this is Marie Mullen from New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Right. And uh, yeah, we, we had a, a high of about a 57% decline in mid-April. And as of Sunday, that decline was at 38%. So we have been gradually seeing some traffic coming back, but we still are seeing significant declines um, over FY19 over last year. And, you know, we're going now into, um, the summer season and that's where our transactions are highest so um you know we're still anticipating that we're going to see significant uh declines um over these next several months depending how things open up and whether folks can actually stay and and come into the state right well, it'll be interesting to see what the memorial day weekend looks like well, that's through Sunday, it was a 38% decline. So that would have included Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. So it did, it did not include Monday, but through Sunday, it, there was a 38%. So that's why the week before, I think was around 43%. So we did see um, some traffic increase over that week with the holiday weekend. But we are still seeing large declines in the transactions coming through the tolls. Yes. Okay, are we still manning all the toll booths? Yes, um, we, well, we, centers. we are manning the, the toll booths and the centers. Um, we are doing cash collections. We are doing change now. At one point we had hmm. stopped uh, doing change. We were doing exact change only to try to limit the touch points for our, our, for the customers and for our toll attendants. Um, but we are doing uh, change again, and um, we do have all the cash lanes open that, that are needed. Uh, we did reduce the third shift, so we, we went down due to the significant decrease in traffic. We did go down to two shifts. We had um, during the day between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m., and we have not been um, staffing during the evening hours because the traffic had been so low and we were actually spending more on toll attendance than we were collecting in revenue. So we had made that decision uh, back at the end of March to, to move to two shifts to try to save some, some money and uh, for the safety. But those folks that go through, um, go through the, the back office system and have you know, the license, they get billed or they can do the seven day to pay, go online and do the seven day to pay. Um, so we're still um, collecting and, and going after that, that that revenue for those folks that were going through late in the evening. Thank you. Um, any further questions for the transportation department about the revenues? Then I think I think that takes care of that. Thank you for waiting so long. Maria, I hope you've been doing something else in the meantime. Thank you. I'm right. learning a lot about the other agencies too. Ah, okay. So um, I think that wraps up everything that that we had in front of us. For those of us that are still awake right now, I can see a few people nodding a little bit. Um, we're going to, the Republicans, I think, are going to hold a caucus tomorrow. 
Representative Major is muted at the moment. There he is. Yes, the Republicans are holding a caucus in the morning. And we're holding one Friday afternoon, which gives us all a chance to go and look at all these numbers and at the numbers that we've done before um, and try to figure out where we are. I don't know at this point if we're going to end up with a single uh, estimate for us taxes or a range. But I, I think the committee's right that we ought to, to see if we feel more comfortable with some kind of range, even for, for this, this year. And then, uh, Representative Major, it sounded, looked like you were trying to say something. Yes. You're not um, muted. That was a question I have for you, is that we went through this today and just about everybody gave us a number rather than a range. Yes. And I anticipated that we were going to get a range. Yes. Uh, so what is your plan for Monday? Well, it depends on what we come back with from our two caucuses. And I think you and I need to get together this weekend and and or send each other an email. Yeah. And see where we are on these things. Um, a single number seems pretty difficult at this point. A single number for 2020, probably. Is something we could attempt. Right. The trouble is the business taxes and the IND taxes. We really don't know how much of it is going to come in in June. Right. The, um, in 2021, I would rather stick with a range. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I. Is there anyone else who wants to horn in on this before we? Well, I, I agree. I'm sorry, I saw Patrick put his hand up. He did it better oh, yeah. than I did. I just jumped okay. in. Sorry. Patrick okay, uh, gets to talk a lot. Why don't you say I something? Don't have to say something. something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in. I, I do think that for fiscal year 21, we uh, should do a range. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how we do that, but, uh, and also I think the truth is for this fiscal year, even though we're very close to the end, we've got two accounts that are, that could come in in very different ways. Um, and uh, we just, we don't know. And to pretend that we do know with a single number, mm -hmm. uh, I'm uncomfortable with. So I, I'd prefer to, even if it's just a variant from the norm that uh, the DRA has given us, say plus or minus 10%, I don't know, I'm just throwing that out. Um, some way of, of splitting it out into a high and a low. Yeah, uh, I, 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 agree with, or, I agree with you, Dick. Um, that for the business taxes and interest and dividends, especially since it's been screwed up by getting pushed out to June. Uh, we'll do a range on that and the rest of them, we could stick with singles. Yeah, I agree with mm -hmm. that. It is also true that in fiscal year 21, um, there are, are a number of uh, lines that are basically single number of lines, I think. We don't have yes. any extra information on them. Most of them. Yeah, probably most of them. With uh, their intent to being to revise them later. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. I wonder if we could just ask Chris Shea on particularly interest in dividends and uh, and the business taxes when they if 
if the biggest businesses, for instance, do as um, the DRA was saying and wait until they have finished their, their federal returns, which will be July 15th, and then start divvying it up among the states. We will see that money in late July if we're lucky and probably in August. And they will, what they, they, they capture that for the CAFR so it never shows up in the 21 money. Hmm. And it, dis, it hasn't gotten into the 20 money so from our perspective, it's just disappeared. So Commissioner uh, Steph had mentioned that there's a 60 day window once the year closes that they'll look at um, the revenues coming in to determine should they have been credited to just ended or is it okay to stay in the current fiscal year that they're in? Um, right. So you're correct. You wouldn't see it in your June reports. Um, you would just see it reflected in, in the CAFR um, if there was more revenue you see uh, an increase in the business taxes once the CAFR, you know, and once it went through the audit and all the um, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. But you wouldn't wouldn't re be reflected in um, your other um, revenue focus, the um, preliminary cash base or the preliminary um, unaudited wouldn't necessarily reflect that. And it won't show up in August either. In no. the in the monthly no, it would be um, they would make an adjustment for it um, once they they've believe it's recognized for the prior year so you shouldn't see it in your right so maybe we ought to handle that with some kind of footnote in our estimate that we believe that there's another 18 million million call it coming in July or August which belongs to June and which will not be seen again, <laughs> except in the CAFR. <laughs> but I mean, I think what I took from today's conversation from DRA is that they really need to see June come to an end to see how the behavior of the uh, the companies and, and taxpayers okay. um, kind of seen for the month. You know, they mm -hmm. think there's 18 million of uh, money that people pushed out to June when they probably shouldn't have. Are they going to pay? That was one of the questions. And if they pay, there's going to be some penalty and interest associated with that when the auditors get done with them. Right. Other, other factors related to federal return and, and the big companies deciding, um, is it better to, to, you know, New Hampshire as a smaller state and say, okay, I'm willing to, to pay penalties and interest on what I might not pay to, in order to pay for a larger company, uh, excuse me, a larger state and avoid a bigger uh, penalty and interest. And those are all behaviors that nobody can really predict at this time. So I don't know if you need a note on your estimates because you, based on the conversations I've had with you is that you and on your committee looking at fiscal 21 um, pretty regularly throughout the, the upcoming year. So you would get a sense from the next time you get some information from DRA, what actually occurred. And if you then need to make a note, that might be the time to do it. I don't remember that we've ever even gotten that information, except maybe two years later <laughs> when we were talking about previous performance. But um, they did say that these larger companies seem to be waiting until they had finished their federal returns, and they're going to finish their federal returns in July. <laughs> no, that's correct. So anyway, it's the best guess. I think it's best guess. I don't know if you need to put a note. I mm -hmm. have uh, three members that have questions, though. Yeah. Yes, we've got three members with questions or comments. Representative Abrami. Okay, I have a larger question. I mean, what's the pressure on us to do twenty-one uh, estimates now and not wait until after June? People looking for a number. Are people looking for a number? They're looking for a number. And there's also the question of whether, um, well, no, that's for that's for 20. Yeah, 20, I-, I they're, they're basically looking for a number. At some point, I would say by 
August, we're going to have to try to do something serious about 2020, 21, mm. because there may, I mean, depending on, on what happens, if the governor maintains control of everything until, after, until the election and after, then on, we can't do a supplemental budget, but we did two supplemental budgets in the Great Recession, yeah. readjusting oh. things and programming out where the spending had to be cut and how much spending had to be cut. And for that, you <coughs> needed revenue estimates. And think, that was done uh, oh, before sorry. in September. Norm? No, it's bad. Yeah, you, we oh. need the revenue estimates to the best of our ability so that the, the executive that's handling the budget knows whether there's sufficient funds or he has to start cutting. If we mm -hmm. give the revenue estimates halfway through the year, it makes the job more difficult for him. Right. The later we get upset, if it's going to be a question of going, going worse rather than going better, uh, the more cuts have to be made. So I, I think we have no choice but to do a range then because as many, there's 20 of us in this committee and there's probably 20 opinions as to how quickly things are going to open up. Because mm -hmm. um, that's the real elephant in the room. Now, some of the revenue streams are not really affected at all. And, yeah. it, and if you look at the main ones, they're, they're influenced by different things. But I can see on Monday or even our, our, our uh, subgroups or uh, caucuses that that'll be the main dis discussion. I mean, is it a V? Is it a V? Not a V? What, what's going to be? Uh, that'll really dictate the revenue. Uh, so I, I can see... Uh, in my mind, the high estimate is is based on a, a quick quick opening, and a low estimate's based on a on a slow opening. Um, so I guess that's what mm -hmm. my thinking is on this. And it for at least some of the revenue sources. For some of the revenues. Some are not affected at all. Right. And others might be affected, but in very different way. Absolutely. So it's revenue, yes. revenue that discussions revenue by revenue stream. If, yeah. we, if we all knew there was a vaccine around the corner, it would be <laughs> <There isn't. laughs> We'll be really lucky if we've got one by a year from now. I know. But uh, Representative Southworth had his hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, could I suggest, I think it would save a lot um, of time. I think it would save a lot of time on Monday if uh, you already come in with a range that we could play with rather than starting at zero because um, we're, it's not going to be way off from the agency estimate. Um, just to have a starting range, I think, would save a lot of time. Um, maybe mm -hmm. after two caucus, a couple of you could talk, but it just yeah. seems like that'd be a big time saver. And maybe even the range could be um, on our sheet or we yeah. can put it on our sheet. Because if we start yeah. at zero, it's going to go around and around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Norm and I, I think, could could do that. That would help everyone, I think. Afterwards. Okay. And Jenny, you had your hand up. Um, Patrick uh, asked my question. Like, oh. what, yeah. Okay. <laughs> pressure on us to get it done for twenty twenty one. I knew I should have started with the person who hadn't asked many questions yet. Fine. Okay, so we're all set until our caucuses and then Monday, right? And the Democratic one is going to start at one. I don't have the confirmation yet because I haven't looked at my email all day on um, from uh, Dan, if it's going to come from him or not. If not, I think Jerry had suggested that he could fill in. So, so that's how Stay you'll true. get something from one or the other. Yeah, I'll need I'll need co-host help because I got to step out. But other than that, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm sort of getting. Oh, I got something else from Dan. You don't know how many 
bureaucratic details there. Even Norm doesn't know how many bureaucratic details there are mixed into trying to do this stuff virtually. But, why you so, get the big box. Hmm? That's why you get the big box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Nobody gives me that extra 25 bucks <laughs> or even five. <laughs> Make sure you push your button so you get your mileage. <laughs> I think we're getting mileage for the 11th. Wow. Well, we're going it's right, so a regular we're session. They ought to give us mileage. We haven't heard about that yet. Okay, so we all set now? Yeah, we're all set now. Okay. On what you want to go? Anybody want to move adjournment? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. I'm getting ice cream. <laughs>